Great, welcome to the afternoon session. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to now announce Harold Steinecker from the University of Vienna talking about gravity as a quantum effect on quantum space time. Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for putting together this meeting in, under these circumstances. That's very much appreciated. And for giving me a slot to speak. Um, so, the topic of this talk, I, the talk is actually quite closely related to several of the previous ones. For example, the last one by Christoph Wetterich, who considered emergent gravity in some sense, and also to some of the string, more stringy talks. But the specific approach will be very different. And so I will try to explain how higher spin gravity can emerge on in a suitable background within a very specific matrix model. Namely, the so called type 2B matrix model, which is also known as IKKT matrix model, because it was introduced by these four gentlemen. It is hard to read. This is Ishibashi, Kawai, Kitasawa, and Tsuchiya. In fact, Kawai is in this workshop. He talked yesterday. Tsuchiya will be in the next workshop talking, I don't know, tomorrow or on Wednesday. Um, so, this matrix model is, of course, very closely related to string theory, more specifically, type 2B string theory. Um, in particular, it is maximally supersymmetric, so it has very special properties. And we'll see in the course of this talk that this is completely essential. So everything that I will say only works with this very specific model, and any other model will not work. And you will see why. Um, now, in fact, one of the sort of secret motivations for this approach is to try to preserve the power of string theory and the special properties of string theory, but to avoid the landscape. So we heard in Peter Lewis' talk that there is well, there is this huge landscape, and somehow, I mean, for me, this is not something acceptable. And I think, or I claim, that there is actually a way to get three plus one dimensional gravity from that matrix model, which has stringy properties, without any target space compactification. Okay, so, well, more specifically, I will show you that this model leads to some sort of a higher spin gauge theory on a particular type of background, on a particular type of geometries which is a, some sort of a quantum space time. Um, and on these backgrounds, well, so it, it is a high spin gauge theory, so it has something to do with gravity clearly, but we'll see also that the, the classical action is, is different from GR. So the classical action, of course, does not coincide with, with, with the Einstein Hilbert action. So that means it's sort of a, it's a slightly different, I would, I think one should call it a pre-gravity theory, similar to the pre-geometry we had in the previous talk. Um, however, the point is, and that's really the main point I want to make today, and that is a new result, that as soon as you include quantum effects, and of course you have to include quantum effects, and actually it can now be done at one loop level, and as soon as you do that, then you do get an induced einstein hilbert term, which is in some sense not surprising, but the point is you're not going to actually compute it. And so that means that in the end of the day, the, the sort of gravity that you get here probably is really close to gravity as it should be. Uh, and moreover, we'll see that even the cosmological constant problem finds a nice solution here. Uh, so this is actually not yet published. It will be published soon, hopefully, um, but anyway. Yeah, and I would also like to emphasize that everything I'll do will, will be within the weak coupling regime. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to talk about one loop. There will be no holography, and also there will be no target space compactification, as, as I already emphasized. OK, so the outline of this talk is the following. Um, first, I have to explain a little bit uh, what to do or how to think about these young Mills matrix models, and in what sense um, there is an emergent geometry in this framework. Then I will discuss a little bit two very specific examples. One is the fuzzy four-dimensional hyperboloid, and the other is, uh, is related to that space, and it's actually a Lorentzian space. It's a three plus one-dimensional space-time, which is actually quite a reasonable model for physical space-time. And we'll discuss the linearized fluctuation spectrum on this background, and there will be a no-go statement. Now, more important or more interesting from gravity point of view is, is always the nonlinear regime. And now the nonlinear regime is also sort of reasonably under control. So I will explain briefly a frame metric torsion and co some covariant formulation can be achieved here. And then the main thing I hope that I find enough time to discuss that will be the quantization. As I say, it's not yet published, but soon. Um, so I will discuss the one-loop effective action, and I'll show you how it is in principle you can obtain or you can compute the, the Einstein-Hilbert action, and there will be extra stuff, as always, in this kind of context. And 
Also, there seems to be no cosmological constant problem. Now, for the basic framework, there is a review written here, and for the other things, no, there is no review yet, sorry. <laughs> but you can hear that all of these things are, of course, published. Okay, so let me start very briefly with the, with the framework. So how do you think about, how, should, how you should think about such matrix models? And it's actually very easy. All you have to know is quantum mechanics. So we are all very familiar with that. And so if we have an action, it's an action of, or it's an action for matrices. So we have a certain number of Hermitian matrices, in fact, 10 matrices. And given these 10 matrices, there is an action. And whenever you have an action in physics, what you do, you derive equations of motion and you consider fluctuation and this kind of thing. And that's exactly what we are going to do. So in particular, we'll look for subtle points, classical solution or something like that. And subtle points or solutions of such an action will be given by a certain set of matrices. So you have 10 explicit matrices given. And the claim is these matrices will generically describe a non commutative space, more precisely, a quantized symplectic manifold embedded in target space. So in target space, in our case, will be R9, like in string theory. And this is, of course, what you know from, from quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, emission op op operators are quantized functions on phase space. So in quantum mechanics, phase space is the thing, but now this will be considered as physical configuration space rather than phase space. But otherwise, it's completely analogous. So think of these matrices as quantized embedding functions from your brain. This is really like a brain in string theory into target space. So these are just these coordinate functions as functions on the brain. That's how to think of these um, matrices. And as I will emphasize, this is actually pretty generic. So this is not some very special framework, which I like. Uh, this is, in fact, you can almost go the, way, the other way around. And I will explain. If you have sort of almost a set of almost committed matrices, you can actually pretty much reconstruct the underlying manifold. So it, it's, I think this is the, the correct point of view here. Now, if you have such a matrix configuration, which is a quantized brain, these matrices, because they don't commute, they generate an algebra function. And this algebra function will be typically the full endomorphism algebra on that Hilbert space. And you interpret this endomorphism algebra as quantized algebra function on the underlying space. So that's the idea of non commutative geometry. Now, to understand things, it's always good to, the, to go to the semi classical regime, which means that you, you can replace commutators by Poisson brackets. And well, if you do that for the matrix model, then this sort of trace with the trace always reduces to the integral with respect to the symplectic volume form. And then this model somehow, now it looks like that. And this really looks like a higher dimensional Poisson Sigma model. And so, so th this gives you, I think that the correct intuition, how to think of these matrix models. So it's kind of a higher dimensional Poisson Sigma model. It's in fact, it's sort of related to the doc of Hermann Nicolai a couple of days ago, but now we will consider not just two dimensional brains, but higher dimensional brains. Okay, so that's the same classic point of view here, which is very useful. And again, I want to briefly emphasize that you, know, you may wonder why do I consider non commutative configurations? The matrix model actually also has commutative solutions. That's fine, but those are very special, but they kind of have measures here, and I think they're actually misleading. Um, and so, so in fact, it turns out for, for these commutative solutions, the underlying space is actually double, has twice the dimension, and, and it's sort of, this is, this is a dangerous thing, and I don't think that one, one should focus on these. Rather, one should focus on the generic matrix configurations, and those can actually be quite generically understood as quantized symplectic spaces. And the general construction here, how to go from one side to the other, is discussed, for example, in these papers. Okay, so that's the interpretation, the framework. Now, if you want to talk about gravity, of course, we need a metric. And in fact, there is a very clear way to get the effective metric on these brains in the matrix model, and it works as follows. The idea is obvious. You just look at the kinetic term for fluctuation. So given such a configuration, there are fluctuations. Fluctuations will propagate on that geometry. You look at the kinetic term, and you read off the effective metric for these fluctuations. That's the obvious thing to do. And it can be done very easily. And it goes as follows. So take such a background at the most general fluctuation, expand the action to quadratic order, you get something like that. And 
Now to simplify the technicalities, let us let me just focus on the fluctuations which are transversal to these planes. Then all these indices disappear. I mean, it's just a technical complications, complication, and basically only this term survives. And this term. So let me consider such a transversal fluctuation. Let me call it phi because it's more intuitive. It's a scalar field. And the kinetic action for the scalar field then has this form. And this really is a second order differential operator because in a second, in, in, in a semi classical limit, you can write it in this form. What is EA mu? This is the effective frame. And how does it arise? You just replace this commutator here by the Poisson bracket. That's, of course, a derivation. So you can write it like that. It's a vector field. If you put it back in, this is the standard form for a kinetic term for any field theory. And so the bottom line is there is an obvious frame, and the frame in coordinate form has is given by the Poisson bracket between the gen the y this is kind of a generator of the frame that is the configuration in the matrix model and this called some arbitrary coordinates now if you put this together you see you, you get in fact this, the standard form of a kinetic term but you have to uh, rescale the metric here by an appropriate conformal factor and you just play a little bit turns out so the effective metric is given in terms of frame by the standard form except for a conformal factor and the conformal factor is is a dilaton and it, it, it has this form. So rhyme is the symplectic density. So this is really completely straightforward. And now the, the point is that this metric governs all fluctuations in a matrix model, not just the transversal. All the fluctuations are governed by the same metric, also the fermionic ones. And that, of course, as you were, this is really some sort of gravity. I mean, that's the most important property of gravity that you have a universal metric. So that sounds interesting. But the dynamics of this metric, of course, that's not yet clear. Um, Moreover, you can show that sort of the, 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 this is kind of a matrix Laplacian, and this is really the reduces to the ordinary uh, Riemannian Laplacian with respect to this metric. That's just another way of saying the same thing, basically. Um, so this looks very nice. Um, however, there are some issues. Now, one issue is well, if I consider three plus one dimensional brains, and for example, well, then I told you the frame has this form. So there are four generators here. And somehow, if you just consider tangential fluctuations, which is in some sense, the, for some reason, the most obvious thing, then there are not enough degrees of freedom to get the most general four-dimensional metric. Now, this is actually, there is some, uh, the story, there is a longer story. It's not so, so clear. But anyway, that, that is one thing which shows up. Perhaps a more serious issue is that, well, you have an explicit tensor data mu neon space time, and that's something which is also strange. I mean, in physics, we don't have such a tensor, so it's not known. So if anything, they should be very well hidden, and it's a bit, it's a bit worrisome, at least. Again, it's a tricky thing, but it's not really what you like. And the final, of course, the equation of motion for the geometry, you don't get the Einstein equations from the matrix model. So this is really a kind of a pre-gravity theory. But the point is that this pre-gravity theory has good properties under quantization. It's a young Mills-like theory. You can quantize it. And I will show how. And then at the quantum level, then you do recover the einstein hibbert action. And you should, of course, expect it due to some general arguments, which go back to Sakharov, for example. So that's sort of, this is the thing which I want to um, emphasize here, and I want to show you how it works explicitly. Um, but first, okay, so to, to address the first two issues, so these two issues can be resolved in the following way. Namely, you should consider a little bit more sophisticated type of quantum space. Let me call them covariant quantum spaces. This works as follows. The key idea is, well, or the basic structure is that you don't just consider three plus one dimensional space time, but actually a bundle over space time, and the fiber of this bundle will be an S2 fiber in the interesting example. And the whole bundle space is the symplectic space. So, not the base space is symplectic, but the six dimensional bundle space is symplectic in a particular way. And in such a way, and I will show you examples, that the, this theta menu tensor actually averages out precisely to zero on, on space time. So, that's the, the first key. And that there is, well, you probably have a good chance to preserve Lorentz invariance. And that's a very important point here. And I'll explain it a little bit. Um, now, the price to pay for this kind of uh, background is that you automatically get actually a higher spin theory, if you like it or not. You, and you'll see why. So you get the higher spin gauge theory. Well, it's complicated. Um, it's not totally completely understood, of course. But I think I, I think this is the way to go, and probably this is okay. And yeah, I'll discuss this a little bit more. 
And another bonus you get here that now on this kind of space time, you actually obtain the full group of volume preserving diffeomorphism on space time as a gauge group. And that's, of course, very important. Now, the gauge group in the matrix model is, is a very general thing. It just it comes from symplectomorphisms on the underlying symplectic space. And because the symplectic space is now six dimensional, you have enough symplectomorphism to recover the full all the volume preserving diffeomorphism on space time. And that's, of course, that's a very good sign for gravity, obviously. Okay, so there are several examples. The first example of this type is the fuzzy four sphere, which was introduced by Gross, Seklinczyk, Greschneider 25 years ago. And it's actually very interesting stuff. Smith has found many, a lot of work on it. Um, the next example is a non compact version of it, very similar. It's the hyperboloid, which I'll explain briefly in a second. In fact, Hasebe will give a talk tomorrow here um, on something, maybe not that, but anyway, he, he introduced that, I think, first. And from that, using very simple procedure, you get a very nice cosmological space time, actually. And that's the kind of playground that I will use. Um, OK. So let me very briefly explain the idea, the mathematical structure of these covariant space times in the example of the fuzzy hyperboloid H4n. This is a very nice group theoretical construction, which goes as follows. We start with a very specific unitary representation of the conformal group SO4, comma 2. Um, so that's it. And you have to choose the simplest of all possible unitary representation, which is known as, a, as the mini, mini reps or doubleton representations. And they have very special properties. They are irreducible representations under SO4, comma 1. And they have a certain positivity property. And from these properties, it follows very easily. Now, the matrix X is just one. Is a, uh, those are particular of these generators. So the, in this way, you get five emission matrices. And you see from these properties immediately that these matrices satisfy the relation of a four dimensional hyperboloid. And the whole construction is obviously covariant under SO4, comma 1. So in this way, you get a four dimensional quantum space, which is fully covariant. And that's, that's the basic idea. And in fact, it's almost too good to be true, right? How can a quantum space be fully covariant? And what's really going on is the following. This four-dimensional hyperbolic is really a bundle. It's really a six-dimensional symplectic space. In fact, it's a non-compact quantized version of, of CP space, which is really, in fact, it's twist of space. That's the same thing. And it's, I don't want to go through it. It's easy to see that. Um, so that means what you really have is this hyperboloid. And at each point of this hyperboloid, there's a little a hidden two-dimensional sphere. And now that, now I can, you can see why it leads to a higher spin theory, because so the full space of function on this quantum space is really the tensor product kind of, of the space of function on the base manifold H4 times the harmonics on this internal sphere. And the point is that this is an equivalent bundle, which means if you consider the stabilizer group SO4 at this point, it actually rotates the sphere. And that means that the harmonics on the sphere are actually higher spin modes from the point of view of space time. And this is why all the fluctuations really give you a power of higher spin modes. But the nice thing here is the tower is large but finite. So this little n is, a, is an integer, and it should be a large but finite number. So you have a finite truncated tower of higher spin modes. And the matrix model gives you for free a higher spin gauge theory, which is truncated. Um, OK, now we want space time. Space time is a covariant space time is obtained in a very similar way. It just takes slightly, in fact, it takes only four instead of five matrices slightly different combination. And you see what you get in a completely similar way is the Lorentzian space time, which is in fact a Friedman Robertson Walker geometry, which has a big bounds. So this is actually quite a reasonable space time, surprisingly reasonable. And it's a, I don't want to discuss it very much, but it's a K equal minus one cosmology, which is has similar mathematical properties. So that's kind of the playground I have in mind. Now, on this playground, we add fluctuations. And then, as I told you, these fluctuations will be governed by a high spin gauge theory. And this is the kinetic term of this high spin gauge theory. And this is sort of the vector Laplacian for these higher spin modes on this gauge theory. You can diagonalize it. So all of these things are now worked out. And you get certain towers of higher spin modes. So for each spin, you get a certain number of off-shell modes. You also get a certain number of on-shell modes. And so on. I don't really want to go into these details. I don't have time. Then you can do the usual gauge story in, in, in Young Mills gauge theory, just to Fadeh of Popov, it's enough. You gauge fix, you can work out the physical Hilbert space. So the physical Hilbert space of gauge fixed modes modulo P gauge can be worked out, and it goes three. That's the point. And so this is very important. So you get a ghost-free higher spin theory. And it's 
it's almost to be expected, but it's not, not totally trivial, but it has been really, uh, this is a very careful elaboration of a no-ghost theorem here, and there is a no-dachion. So it's a healthy theory, um, but I, there's one issue. Lorentz invariance is only partially manifest. So the rotations are manifest, but boosts are not manifest. So there's still some danger that something could go wrong, but it seems to go well. So because the matrix model is well behaved. Okay, so all of these things can be worked out. You find a consistent higher spin gauge theory. I'm sorry, where am I? Yeah, and uh, I want to discuss this a little bit. And in particular, let me, now we should of course address the nonlinear regime. And I have almost no time to do that. So let me just give you the main, the main um, properties of this nonlinear regime. We start again with this matrix, uh, with the frame. It turns out that this frame is actually the, has a certain constraint. So it's a divergence free frame. This is related to the fact that we have volume preserving um, diffeomorphisms, but there are no manifest Lorentz transformations. So that's one difference to GR, but it's not a physical problem, of course. Um, what did I want to say here? Uh, anyway, yeah, so that's one thing to mention. Maybe I should even have skipped this slide. More importantly, you can understand how gauge transformations, namely how volume preserving um, diffeomorphism arrays from the gauge transformations. It, it's, it's a very straightforward pro procedure. It's just you, it, you use the push forward of Hamiltonian vector fields from a bundle to the base manifold, and you see that these frame transforms indeed under the lead derivative of these um, volume preserving diffeos in the position. So all of this works out very nicely. And to, to get a handle on the dynamics of the geometry, it turns out it's better not to work with the levi chivi connection, but with the Weizenberg connection. That's again, it's a technical stuff. Uh, don't worry too much. So it's natural to use that. Why is it natural to introduce the Weizenberg connection? Because that is a connection which has torsion instead of curvature. So the curvature is zero, but all information is in the torsion. And the torsion of this connection is actually naturally encoded in the matrix model. That's important. Uh, this is what I want to tell you. We will use this in a second. So the matrix model nicely encodes the torsion of this connection. And so it's just a different way of, of proceeding. For example, you can then translate the strange looking equations of motion for the matrix model in a completely covariant form, for example, in this form with the Weizenberg connection, or just in this form here, it's the, the Hodge star. So this is really basically Levi-Civita, a covariant equation for the torsion on this manifold. So there is the nice covariant equations of motion now for these structures. And there's an axion, there's a dilaton, and, and lots of things come up. And this has been worked out recently also in collaboration with Stefan Fredenhagen. Um, so the bottom line is, you have a nice pre-gravity theory. It seems a consistent gauge theory. It has extra degrees of freedom, but it's not g up. And the point is that the action of this gauge theory has actually two derivatives less than the Einstein-Hilbert action. So the Einstein-Hilbert action, how much? Okay, how much time do I have? Okay, all right. Yeah, sorry, I probably I sped up too much. <laughs> so, uh, but this is now an important point. You can actually work out, you can write the Einstein-Hilbert action on this, on such a space in terms of this torsion, which I just introduced. Now, the torsion, I remind you, is the Poisson bracket of the, this is the theta, that's the combinator in a matrix model with an X. So this is a derivative of the theta fields. And that means that the einstein hilbert action is, has two derivatives more than the fundamental matrix model action. And that's, of course, interesting from the quantization point of view, because if you have less derivatives, probably quantization is better behaved. And that's exactly what happens here. So this is the, the action which has good properties on the quantization. And I will show you in the remaining part of this talk that if you quantize this action at one loop, in fact, you get this thing in the effective action. So that's the main message. Now, so let me discuss how to do one loop, at least qualitatively. The first comment is that all of these, all, all I'm going to tell you now only works for the maximally supersymmetric super model. In the non maximally supersymmetric model, everything will diverge and it doesn't make sense. It's really only for that model that things work because the quantization, of the quantum effects are then mild. And the basic message is that the Einstein Hilbert action arises in the one loop effective action on this type of covariant quantum space. And it arises, in fact, in this form, which I just showed you, so that it arises as a contraction of distortion of the Weizenberg connection. And the reason is just a mathematical identity that such a contraction can really be rewritten as an Einstein-Hilbert action, plus some contribution from axioms. But okay, let me ignore those. And we'll also see that the associated Planck 
scale. So, so the Newton constant, so which is the coefficient of the Ricci scalar. Now, this is actually, well, this is tricky. This is actually the Calusa Klein scale, or it's related to the Calusa Klein scale of fuzzy extra dimensions, which you have to add here. So this is something new I didn't tell you yet. So that means you get a reasonable gravity theory only in the presence of fuzzy extra dimensions. What does it mean? So, so far we have a three plus one dimensional brain that leaves you six transversal directions in the matrix model. What do you do with it? Well, then they shouldn't be trivial. There should be some compact quantum space which extends in this transversal space. And there are many examples, explicit matrix examples of such compact quantum spaces. And the details really don't matter at all. It's just important that you have this, then there is an associated Calusa Klein scale, and that actually plays the role of the Newton constant or of the effective Planck scale here. So that's the message. And now I will try to show you how to derive this mathematically. But before doing that, let me emphasize. So this mechanism for, for gravity is a mechanism which only works on the brain. So it has nothing to do with the supergravity that you work with in string theory, because the supergravity and string theory is a nine plus one dimensional, and they did not compactify anything. So there is actually, at one loop level, you also get the, that the nine plus one dimensional supergravity, also in the matrix model. But this is a short range effect from the brain point of view, because 10 dimensional supergravity, you know, it, it, it decays like R to the minus eight, with a very short range, little correction from the point of view of three plus one dimensional space time. So it's there, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't play a significant role. Except in some sense, it turns out that this action, more, more precisely this action is actually, you can understand it as a, had to be supergravity interaction between M and K. So the space time brain N and the extra dimensional brain K, they actually attract, attract each other through the supergravity and the, this so sort of the coupling energy of this attraction that is this strong. So there is a relation to this kind of supergravity picture, but the interpretation is completely different from string theory, and that's why I don't need to compactify. So that's in fact the main message. The rest is just technical stuff. Uh, don't look at the details. So what do you do to derive this one of action? First of all, the quantum the matrix model is clear how to do it. It's just integrate the matrices. There will be some talks in the next week how to do that by Nishimura and Tuchiya maybe and, and, and others. Um, now here I just do one loop, we just do the Gaussian integral, and the, there is a general formula for the Gaussian integral in the maximally supersymmetric matrix model, which has this form. Now the only thing that you should notice here is there is an expansion, and the expansion starts at only at the fourth order term in the expansion. That's a, that reflects the maximal supersymmetry. So usually you would have, have get very strong quantum effects. Because of maximal supersymmetry, it just only starts at the very high order, and that's completely essential. Otherwise, things would diverge, but this is actually finite. So all this trace is actually a finite trace. And you can compute this trace using special techniques, which in also next week, there will be a talk by Yuri Dekru, who will explain a little bit. There's a nice trace formula for how to compute these traces explicitly using what's called string states. And string states are very simple objects, which always exist in this matrix model, They're just this kind of bilinear rank one operators on the Hilbert space. And they really are literally the strings going from X to Y on your brain. And this is an, an exact formula to compute these brains. And this formula is actually useful. You can evaluate it and that's the point. Because you can evaluate because these strings are kind of, they're approximately eigenvalues of the propagator and they're also bilocal. So they have localization properties on position and in momentum space. That this makes it so useful. And then you can just use these things to compute the trace. I don't have time to, Show you the details. Um, so, how much time do I have? <laughs> okay, three, four minutes. Okay, I can show you a few details. So, basically, well, you want to compute this trace of such a complicated expression. And you use the formula which we had here, this trace formula, and you have to evaluate this complicated higher order differential operator on this kind of string states. And you, you use the fact that it's essentially diagonal. So, I mean, in fact, you use the fact that the back, as a background, you consider a very slowly varying geometry. Like in gravity, you have very slowly varying background. And you can, so from the point of view of these string states, it's actually pretty much, the constant is pretty much, the background is pretty much constant. So you can just evaluate these, these string states on, on these operators. And that's why well, you do that. And then you end up with the following approximation formula for this complicated trace. It's, it's now a geometric formula in terms of double integral over the symplectic space. 
and something which you can write down and really compute. And now the point is the following. Again, if you did this in a non supersymmetric model, you would, this trace would have a, an in, a very strong infrared um, problem. And that is exactly the ultraviolet infrared mixing that is known for non commutative field theory. So the ultraviolet infrared mixing, which destroys non commutative gauge theory, but normally, it can be understood very well using these string sets. It's completely manifest. It's just the meaning that the effective action is completely non local and it's totally non acceptable, um, the non locality. But in the maximally supersymmetric model, the non locality is very, very mild and it reduces the effect of this non locality is precisely the bad to be supergravity interaction. And it's an R to the minus eight effect. Precisely, you see here, this is the R to the minus eight, which is precisely the supergravity interaction coming from this trace. So this is a very nice way to understand the special properties of non-commutative gauge theory or field theory. Now, so that means that in this, to evaluate this, we actually have to refine the previous formula because now I have to, this is now actually convergent, this integral. It's almost local, but I have to evaluate. And to evaluate this, one has to refine the formulas a little bit below, and that's what took a long time. There's a way to do that. Again, you start with the string states and then you I will explain to you next week that these short string states, so now it's the short string states which dominate the loop instead of the long ones. And for the short string state, you can think of them as Gaussian wave packets. And this is a precise statement. And now you really know how to evaluate this integral from these. And you can even sort of make long Gaussian wave packets from these string sets. There's kind of like, like wavelets propagating here. And then you can still you can still, still kind of diagonal for these operators, and now you can really compute these traces in an elementary way. And it turns out so the trace of this operator. Um, do, 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 sorry. Yeah, you can evaluate it. It comes on the next slide. Um, you also have to take into account the, the presence of these fuzzy extra dimensions. That's what I told you before. So this is the space time brain, and this is the, the, the extra dimension. And there is now there is a mixed term in this big trace, and the mixed term of this trace leads to the einstein hilbert action as follows. You just work out these commutators, and now this is how the, the torsion of the Weizenberg connection comes in. So you get a, a term which is quadratic in the torsion and some of the K, and there is a convergent integral which you can just compute. And at the end of the day, you find the einstein hilbert action, and the coefficient is a mass scale from this fuzzy extra dimension. So it's really, it's a finite result, and it works out, and this has to do with an axion, I don't, want to explain this in detail. So that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you. So the bottom line is the following. The one loop effective action induces, uh, and includes the einstein hilbert action. The effective Newton constant is set by the kaluza klein mass of these fuzzy extra dimensions. So in particular, if there is no fuzzy extra dimension, there is no einstein hilbert term. Uh, and moreover, one last important bonus is this one. You can, of course, also compute the vacuum energy, and you should compute the vacuum energy, and it's huge as always. But if you do the same computation for the vacuum energy, it goes like this, but it's actually simpler. And if you do it, you find the following very nice thing. You get a very large coefficient, but you get the integral over the symplectic volume form. So this is not the Riemannian volume form, it's a symplectic volume form. And that is a rigid thing. So the symplectic volume form does not gravitate. So that means there is a huge vacuum energy, as we all know, which normally would be a huge cosmological constant, but here it does not gravitate. So I think this is a very exciting feature here. Uh, okay, it needs to be, you know, this needs more work, obviously, but I think that, that that's the kind of thing you really want to have here. Um, all right, so now, of course, this einstein hilbert action comes in addition to the bare matrix model, so the whole thing will be complicated. And because the bare matrix model has two derivatives less, I think that this will dominate the cosmic scale while the einstein hilbert action will dominate some more shorter scale, but all these scales that remains to be understood and worked out in more detail. There's lots of other stuff, axions, Dilladon, and so on, which remains to be understood. By the way, there is also an attractive potential between the fuzzy extra dimensions and the M, so they probably really found, form a bound state, so that's there's a chance that this is really a, a stable object. And okay, so let me summarize. So the point is that some sort of gravity arises as a quantum effect on three dim certain three plus one dimensional quantum space times in this mate in the maximal isometric uh, matrix model. 
All these geometric structures, they, they arise automatically. So you don't have to construct any theory. Everything just falls on, comes out automatically. The matrix model itself is, is a pre-gravity, which is suitable for quantization. And then the real gravity is probably mainly a quantum effect uh, within this model. There is a nice class of covariant quantum spaces, which have a much better behavior on the Lorentz, local Lorentz property. So they have a chance that uh, there is no significant Lorentz violation. Um, there should be some kind of a crossover behavior between a regime where hopefully Einstein Hilbert dominates and then more cosmological regime where probably the bare matrix model dominates. This remains to be understood. Uh, and also the very strong hints that actually there is no cosmological constant problem as I just explained. But all these things need a lot more work and it would also help a lot if more people would, would, would work, would have to work this out. So let me stop here. Thank you, Harold, for this very nice and clear talk. Do we have questions? A little remark and a question. Uh, the remark is uh, you said that uh, about the torsion square term that uh, it has uh, two derivatives less than Anderson Hilbert action, uh, because I suppose you are thinking of the torsion just as a difference of two. Uh, connections uh, or between the connection and you, I mean, and the, the one where you have symmetrized the indices. Not really. Let me go back for a second. Is that what you meant? No, here's the formula. That's what I mean. You see, um, this mean this term is that's a derivative of that thing. So that term theta alpha beta is the common data which enters the matrix model. And so the pure action has just these guys, and the ancillary Hilbert action has second derivatives of these guys. So in that sense, it's higher derivative than the original one. You can also understand it in terms of the frame somehow, but not so easily. Okay. okay. So it's really, it's okay. really, this has, the original one has two derivatives less in terms of the frame, but you cannot write this really in terms of the frame. So that's something you cannot write on an ordinary setting. Nevertheless. Okay, so the, uh, then uh, the question which is very general. Uh, string theory is supposed to describe also all the other interactions, not only gravity. So uh, where would they come from? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks for the question. That's very good. It gives me opportunity to explain that. Now, that is exactly uh, this picture here. So this fuzzy extra dimensions, those are responsible to get interesting physics. So the point is, and so there is a very explicit way to, to put this in a matrix model. And what happens is this, this is done in terms of giving the six transversal scalar fields of certain depth. Then you have a Higgs effect. And that Higgs effect leads to spontaneous breaking of the original UN gauge group into some interesting structure. And we do have a number of examples. Also, I mean, there are some papers with, with George and, and, and Johann Zahn and so on. So there are very interesting such examples where these broken gauge theories Sort of become physically interesting. Now it's not yet; it's not really realistic at this point. But, but you can get in the rough ballpark of uh, supersymmetric standard model something like that. I mean, this is already a bit saying a lot. But this is where the extra physics come from from these fuzzy extra dimensions. And you can get even Carroll from you know, and Carroll gauge theories and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. The first one. Uh... It may be naive, but the, the IKKT model is, uh, as you said, related to string theory, which itself allows to derive uh, the einstein Hilbert uh, uh, gravity plus lots of other stuff in a certain limit. So what's the relation between that gravity and the one you derived? Maybe yes. you said it, but, uh, yeah. but I missed it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again for the question. I said it, but it was too quick. So let me try to say it again. And where is the appropriate slide? Not sure. Where... Yeah, yeah, here, perhaps. So, Everything comes from the one loop effective action. So this thing, if you work out what it is, this gives you the type to be super gravity in target space that you know from string theory, at least at the linearized level. You can really see it explicitly. And it has been known for a long time. In fact, that's the main justification of the matrix model that you see that, for example, interactions between brains reproduce those of super gravity. So that's some other contact with super gravity, but that's really nine plus one dimension super gravity and it's in target space. Now the point is, in string theory, you always focus on the physics on target space. Now, in the matrix model, it becomes obvious that it's actually the physics on the brain which plays a role. So there is actually there is nothing which propagates in the target space here in the perturbative level. Everything propagates on the brain. Therefore, it's governed by a different 
four dimensional metric. That four dimensional metric is, in fact, the open string metric, which people also know in string theory. But the dynamics of this metric, that's what I talked about. And that's so the, the, this talk was basically about the dynamics of the metric on the brain. And that's a totally different story from the metric in target space. And it's not just a reduction of that metric, like in the talk by Kelly Stella. It's really an independent degree of freedom because the brains have a B field and so on and so forth. So that's the relation to string theory. I think we can have one more short question. Can I ask it? And then we will check online for questions. Okay, short one, yes. Uh, thank you for your nice talk, Harold. Uh, very short question. So can you somehow estimate the gravitino mass in this framework? No, no, I, I really. I, I didn't even start to enter the Fermionic sector. There should be something like that. Yeah, there should be the analogs of the gravitinos. No, I really don't know. Let's let's work it out here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Check online for questions, please. So there are no questions online. Let us thank Harold again for the nice talk. Right, the next talk is going to be online by Mario Martone. Actually, I don't know the title yet, so we will see. Right, it appears that um, Martone is not online, but I do see Timo Weigand. Would it be okay to uh, continue with your talk, Timo? Yes, that's okay. Very good. Would be great. So let's share. that's Timo Weigand from the University of Hamburg, talking on quantum gravity conjectures and their geometric manifestation. Thanks for jumping in. Can I start? Should I start the video as well? well you, you got 35 minutes plus five minutes questions, but since we just deleted the talk, I guess I think if you put it, it's fine. And go ahead. Okay. One second. I, 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 um, I was trying to start the video, and it says, unable, you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Is that intended? The host is working on it. OK, good. I think I can now. Okay, very good. So um, let me start by thanking the organizers for the very kind invitation to speak at the um, uh, Humboldt Colleague. And it's really a great pleasure to participate. It's a pity I can't be there in beautiful Corfu, um, but I hope. Um, I will be uh, very soon again in the future. So this talk is about quantum gravity conjectures and uh, manifestations in geometry via string theory. It's mostly going to be work to appear with Sung Julie and Wolfgang Derche, but at the beginning, in order to give a bit um, more of an introduction, I will also review um, previous work um, with these collaborators. The context of this talk is going to be the Swampland program, about which we have already heard a lot in the context of this workshop. In particular, as Dieter List already reviewed um, on Saturday morning, the goal of the Swampland program is to come up with criteria which, in effect, the field theory has to satisfy in order to arise as a low energy approximation of a consistent quantum gravity theory. And this is what then would distinguish on the one hand, the landscape of fully consistent effective field theories that come from a fully consistent quantum gravity from on the other hand, the swampland of effective field theories, which are good quantum field theories, but which cannot be coupled to quantum gravity. And clearly this is a very ambitious program because any answer to it would have major effect on different areas of fundamental physics. 
For instance, the original um, or one of the more recent motivations behind this program was to understand better uh, the possible dynamics of scalar fields within, trans uh, within um, inflation at the early universe, possible um, tra traversing of field space. We heard about this um, also today in, um, in, in the talk by Hans Peter um, um, on uh, possible constraints on inflation from uh, the gravity conjecture, for example, or others. Um, other important questions, fundamental questions would be um, whether quantum gravity uh, allows for matter-stable de Sitter vacua, of course, an important, phenomenologically important question. Um, can ADS vacua have scale separation? Or maybe a little bit more modestly, can there be constraints on the charge spectrum of a theory um, on low energy supersymmetry breaking? We heard about this also in Dieter's talk on Saturday. So clearly, given the fact that we do not yet know for sure what the quantum gravity is. It is very hard to make progress in this direction. Um, and indeed, two types of approaches are being taken. The first is to try to be as general as possible, to try to make as few as possible assumptions about um, quantum gravity and try to come up with general criteria based on general consistency conditions, which such a theory um, should satisfy. This is rather broad in scope, but necessarily speculative, oftentimes heuristic. And in fact, in this context, um, people formulate conjectures or proposals for such criteria that would distinguish the landscape from the swampland. And even though this is oftentimes speculative and heuristic, nonetheless, the emerging web of conject, uh, the, the emerging set of conjectures actually forms an interesting web with non-trivial interrelations and many logical connections. The second type of approach would be more uh, top-down, namely um, once one makes specific assumptions about the type of quantum gravity, then of course it is much easier to um, come up with um, consistency conditions on the effective field theory. And in particular, we can confront the general ideas from the more general type of Swampland program um, with explicit realizations within a particular type of quantum gravity. For example, and this will be the type of quantum gravity of, of this talk, um, string theory. And in the context of string compactifications, in fact, this in turn allows for yet another aspect, namely possible relations to mathematics. Namely, the, this would be the picture. We have on the one hand, the general ideas about quantum gravity, the quantum gravity conjectures. Once confronted with string theory, they make a prediction for what the set of consistent string vacua um, should satisfy. And in turn, in every class of string back here, about which we are confident enough, we can test the, under, or the more broad quantum gravity conjectures, maybe falsify them, and use this to possibly even develop them further. And this step, the test via in, in string theory, works hand in hand with a study of the underlying mathematics. I mean, we can consider the uh, compactification spaces of string theory underlying the string back here. We can use some of our mathematical knowledge about, the, about them to try and prove these quantum gravity conjectures in string theory. But we can also turn tables around and tr translate the quantum gravity conjectures into conjectures about the underlying mathematics, which can then be, in fact, interesting from a purely mathematical point of view as well. And this can affect two types of data, both in physics and in mathematics, um, discrete data or continuous data. Discrete data could be affected, for example, by conjectures or general ideas about bounds on matter spectra or ranks of gauge groups in quantum gravity. So if one had um, a general idea or a general principle that would set a sharp bound on, for example, the rank of the gauge group in a possible um, theory in the landscape, then um, this type of bound could be translated into a suitable in, into a corresponding bound on properties of the string compactification spaces. Namely, it would give rise to bounds on topological invariance on compactification spaces, which may or may not be known in mathematics already. Second, continuous data. Um, a lot about these uh, in, in these quantum gravity conjectures is about trying to understand the behavior of quantum gravities at infinite distance in their moduli spaces. And this then in turn is in one-to-one -one correspondence with universal properties of 
um, moduli spaces of string theory on the boundaries of the moduli space. And indeed, in this talk, I'm going to um, give examples um, of both of these types of considerations. I will be very brief on the first example, the discrete data. And um, I'll make the case that very briefly, um, um, the completeness conjecture implies that six dimensional supergravity theories as um, a particular example should have a rank of abelian gauge groups not bigger than 24. This should be a strict bound, which then will translate into corresponding bound in geometry, namely the so-called rank of model Y group of elliptic three folds. I'll come to this in a second. And the main part of this talk will be about the interplay of continuous data in quantum gravity and in mathematics, namely the swamped and distance and the emergent string conjecture go hand in hand and have implications for the degenerations of geometry underlying string theory at infinite distances in Keller and complex structure moduli space. So let's just devote one slide to this first topic to be complete and give a bit of an overview. Bounds on possible ranks. Where would possible bounds on ranks of gauge groups or um, um, the, the sort come from um, in quantum gravity? The underlying idea is the completeness conjecture about which we are going to hear um, more also later this evening in, in Hiroshi Uri's talk. Namely, this is the conjecture that in a quantum gravity theory, every charge in the weight letters should actually correspond to a physical state in much difference to what we are used to in pure quantum field theory. Now, the necess necessary existence of these states in the weight letters can then be used in order to deduce certain consistency conditions on the quantum gravity. And this was discussed in particular in the context of six dimensional theories with eight supercharges, the n equal 1,0 supergravity theories. Um, first in this paper cited here, and we heard um, about this also in Ruben Minassian's talk, I think it was on Saturday. Namely, in such theories from the supergravity point of view, since there are two forms, there must also be one plus one dimensional objects um, uh, in general, um, non-critical strings or all sorts of strings to which these couple. Now in the supergravity, in the classical supergravity a priori, these strings may or may not exist as physical objects, but according to the completeness conjecture, they must exist as, as physical objects in a six dimensional 1,0 quantum gravity theory. This means that um, we can study the anomalies and uh, constraints such as unitarity and so on on the, the world sheet theory of these one dimensional objects to derive constraints on the supergravity um, um, as such. And using these um, uh, types of considerations, one can indeed show just in quantum gravity from the consistency of this whole set of uh, whole, whole letters of um, six dimensional strings that um, in such a supergravity theory, the number of abelian gauge groups can never be bigger than 24. This is supposed to hold according to the completeness conjecture as a consequence of the completeness conjecture for every six dimensional n equal 1,0 supersymmetric quantum gravity theory. So this is the quantum gravity part. Now, what does this have to do with mathematics? Now let's assume we realize such a six dimensional theory in string theory, for example, by compactification of F theory on a Calabi-Yau threefold to six dimensions. We know where the abelian gauge groups in such theories come from. They are in one-to-one -one correspondence with a certain arithmetic property of the space, namely the space that the elliptic vibration of the threefold admits an extra section. The number of these sections is called the rank of the model Y group. And if the physical conjecture is correct, then this would imply that the rank of the model Y group of every elliptic Calabi-Yau threefold cannot exceed the value of 24. This in fact is an interesting conjecture because um, in mathematics, there is no known, known bound at all on the rank of the model Y group of Calabi-Yau threefolds. For Calabi-Yau twofolds, in other words, for K3 surfaces, such a rank is known, the rank is 16, and it is indeed um, uh, realized. Uh, the, the, bound, the bound is 16, and it is indeed realized. But for threefolds in the mathematics literature, no such bound exists. And this would be an instance where translating these general, in this case, quantum gravity ideas of six dimensional theories into mathematics also leads to new ideas in mathematics. 
And it will now be interesting in the future to try to see if this bound um, uh, can be proven to be a bound or if, it can, um, if there are counter examples to the conjecture, in which case also the conjecture above would be wrong. So this is very testable and um, also leads to interesting ideas in mathematics. And while such a proof is not in sight, to my knowledge, at least one can try to see if one can realize this maximal rank of 24. And in fact, together with Antonella Grassi, we were able to um, uh, uh, at least set the current record. Um, the current record for the rank of the model Y group or the number of U1 gauge bosons would be at the moment 10. This is of course far away um, from saturation. And as I said, this would be an avenue now in arithmetic geometry to try and prove or disprove this idea. So this just as, um, um, one aspect of trying to um, translate bounds on ranks of gauge groups or types of representations or whatever into corresponding bounds on, to on um, topological invariance in mathematics. So now I'm coming to the main part of the talk, namely um, the behavior at infinite distance of mod in moduli space and uh, manifestations via underlying string geometry. The key player here clearly is the famous Swampland distance conjecture, one of the quantum gravity conjectures by Uguri and Buffa. And it states that in a quantum gravity theory, the moduli space must always be non-compact. It must admit infinite distance directions with respect to the metric on moduli space in such a way that as we go to infinite distance in the moduli space, an infinite tower of states becomes light exponentially fast in the geodesic distance that is traversed. So the cartoon of this moduli space I took here from the beautiful review by Evan Palti on these matters. And um, let me also note that um, a number of refinements have been proposed in particular, according to the refined swampland conjecture, um, the um, parameter C which controls the exponential decay of the masses of the infinite number of states that become light at infinite distance should be of order one. This conjecture is very important for the, this whole web of um, quantum gravity ideas. Um, it gives an argument against the sitter vacua in asymptotic regions of moduli space as was discussed in this paper. This does not affect the question of whether or not the sitter vacua might exist in the interior of moduli space, but at least asymptotically at infinite distance or towards infinite distance, the swampland distance conjecture gives a strong argument that the potential should fall off monotonically and hence there should not be a, a dissider vacua out there in the asymptotic region. It also serves as a source of inspiration and intuition for the ADS distance conjecture. Um, we heard about this um, in Dieter Lust's talk. And in principle, this favors parametrically large field inflation, again, at least asymptotically. Once more, what happens in the interior of moduli space at order one distances in, um, in, um, in, 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 in uh, Planck units um, is not affected by, uh, by these considerations at all. So this just as a reminder of the Swampland distance conjecture and why um, it is considered to be very interesting within the set of Swampland ideas. Now, given this importance, um, it's not surprising that numerous checks and tests have been performed in various corners of the string landscape. The um, uh, key example being um, the complex structure moduli space of type 2b compactifications, where the states that would become light at infinite distance would be four dimensional n equal 2 BPS states from wrapped D3 brains. And I'm uh, listing here um, a set of the key references um, studying um, the realization of the swampland distance conjecture in uh, type 2b complex structure moduli space. Yeah. While the swampland distance conjecture tells us that at infinite distance, a tower of states should become light, it does not yet tell us the nature of the states which become light. Or put differently, what is the type of physics that we expect to encounter at infinite distance in the moduli space? A refinement of the swampland distance conjecture, however, the emergent string conjecture, claims that whenever we can take an infinite distance limit in quantum gravity, one of the following two possibilities should be realized. Namely, either the theory reduces to a weakly coupled string theory, meaning that the infinite tower of states that has become light is actually the tower of string excitations. Or if this is not the case, then the theory should be decompactifying 
i.e. the infinite tower of states is in fact the tower of Calusa Klein excitations. So the important aspect of this emergent string conjecture is that it holds or it's supposed to hold, claims to be true, also in situations where in the interior of moduli space, we do not have a obvious description of the theory as a string theory. For example, if we start with an M theory in the interior of moduli space, where strings as such one plus one dimensional objects play no role, then nonetheless, the claim is that in every dimension at infinite distance in the moduli space, either we encounter a string tower at infinite distance and the theory then goes to a new weakly coupled string duality frame or dual such duality frame, or the theory decompacted. And as such, the statement has um, so far been confirmed in a number of non-trivial, non-perturbative setups, and if in which the existence and the uniqueness of such emergent critical strings at infinite distance in moduli space could be directly linked to properties of the quantum geometry of the string compactifications. For example, in the Keller moduli space of F theory of M theory, an example of a theory that would not be a string theory, um, um, or type to a string theory in six, five, and four dimensions. In the hypermoduli space, 4D n equal two theories, this is where quantum gravity effects become particularly important. In n equal one setups, for example, M theory on G2 manifolds and F theory compactifications to four dimensions with four supercharges. Let me just give you a flavor of um, the um, um, ideas how, um, how such a proof of the emergent string conjecture in a particular framework of string theory could look like. In this class of work, we tried to, or we in fact provided a classification of all possible classical infinite distance limits in the Keller moduli space of F theory compactifications to four dimensions with minimal supersymmetry. This means we started with compactification to four dimensions of F theory. The compactification space is a three complex dimensional space. We, it is a Keller manifold and we consider the infinite distance limits now on this Keller manifold. And the result of this analysis is um, summarized in this cartoon here. All the infinite distance limits can be classified as follows and fall into one of the three classes. Either what happens is that the compactification space, our internal manifold is of the type that it's a sphere vibration over another space, so a, a rational vibration, P1 vibration. The volume of the sphere fiber goes to zero while the volume of the base goes to infinity. And in fact, this is the unique fastest shrinking, non-contractible cycle whose volume goes to zero in this class. The second possibility would be that the curve that shrinks is not a sphere, but rather a torus. And the third possibility is the rest. There does not exist any unique fast shrinking T2 or P1 fiber. So this is just in one sentence, essentially the result of this classification in the geometry. So how now does this, does this interact with physics? The claim is that these two classes here, the P1 or the T2 vibration classes, these give rise to, in fact, um, unique weakly coupled duality frames at infinite distance, which become relevant. And the tower of states are excitations of the weakly coupled strings that emerge there. There is all the other types of infinite distance limits. The generic type of infinite distance limit would be a decompactification. So here is um, uh, again, just an idea of why this would be true. Consider this type of limit where um, we have a P1 vibration, a rational curve, its volume goes to zero. The volume of the base goes to, in, goes to infinity at the same time. Now, usually you would say that this should be a decompactification limit because if the base volume goes to infinity, we would get Carlos Klein states and these would indicate a decompactification to a higher dimensional space. However, in string theory, we also have extended objects. We have D3 brains in this case, which can wrap the fiber whose volume goes to zero. These give rise to a string. So if you wrap the D3 brain on a curve, you get a string in four dimensions. The tension of the string goes to zero as the volume of this curve goes to zero. So in addition to the Kalusa Klein states, there are also therefore the excitations of this asymptotically tensionless string. 
And the important point is now that, as it turns out, this string is not just any string, but it's the critical, the critical heterotic string. This is a non-trivial consequence of the uh, geometry of this P1 vibration. So a lot of the beef is really buried um, in in the details of this um, of this um, um, uh, of this geometry here. And since the string is a critical heterotic string, we know that its excitations. Um, once, once the string becomes tensionless, in fact, constitute um, physical states, um, which we identify with the tower of infinite, um, uh, with the infinite tower um, that becomes light um, according to this uh, Swampton distance conjecture. At the same time, all the other limits are necessarily decompactification limits. This one can also show. And this is a picture that it's true not only classically, but also survives at least the leading quantum corrections in 4D n equal one. So the emergence of the string uh, could somehow be could could be could be um, um, in fact be argued for and shown in this whole framework of four-dimensional n equal one compactifications for F theory. And as a corollary, the string emergence also allows us to prove the weak gravity conjecture in this framework. Why? Essentially because the excitations of this asymptotic heterotic string um, can be shown to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture, namely the uh, fact that um, um, there must exist, again, a tower of states whose charge to mass ratio is bigger or equal than the charge to mass ratio of every extremal black hole um, in the theory. Um, this uses um, um, properties of the elliptic genus of this um, um, uh, heterotic string in 4D n equal one, um, Wolfgang Lerch, in fact, last week gave a talk um, for, about the underlying mathematics of course at Jacobi forms um, that are needed in order to prove the existence of this tower of states um, in the string spectrum at infinite distance, which satisfies the weak gravity conjecture. Okay, so um, now let me come to the new work. Um, as I try to review, there are uh, ways how to verify the emergent string conjecture um, in classes of string compactifications. And this has been done for the Keller moduli sector of minimally supersymmetric compactifications, F theory compactified to four dimensions. So an obvious question is, as a string theorist, can there also be infinite distance directions in the open moduli space or in the brain moduli space? Well, in general, uh, we cannot distinguish in string theory between open and closed moduli spaces. For example, in F theory, there is only a unified complex structure moduli space of the elliptic vibration, which um, incorporates both the open and um, uh, uh, parts of the closed moduli space. So the better question to ask is therefore, how do we understand the physics and the mathematics of the complex structure degenerations in F theory at infinite distance then, at infinite distance? And the simplest, uh, but already quite complicated um, um, uh, class um, uh, of configurations would be therefore to study such limits in F theory and elliptic K3 manifolds to eight dimensions. So this would be the first step in order to understand this at the si at a similar level of detail in four dimensions as I just reviewed for in the context of the Keller degeneration. And in fact, in the remaining minutes of this talk, I would like to take um, um, to, to tackle this question from three related viewpoints. Namely, first, um, I, I will argue that the infinite distance limits have an interpretation in terms of PQ brains, namely as limits in which affine or loop algebras um, emerge. Second, from the geometric point of view, more in the spirit of this talk, of in the uh, according to the algebraic geometry of semi-stable degenerations. The infinite distance limits are described as Kulikov models and their Bayesian realization. And third, I will at least briefly mention duality with the heterotic string, which allows us to give to give a physical interpretation of the types of states that um, we get at infinite distance. But before I go there, I'd like to ask the organizers how much more time I have in order to time it accordingly. You have at least ten minutes, or even fifteen. Ten minutes. Since we're watching. So okay. Thank you. Time. Okay, great, great, thank you. So it was late. So, so here's was, the main. Just a second. So uh, the second talk was skipped. So Timo Weigand started early in case you just joined now. Okay. okay, good. So here's, here's, the, here's the main proposal. 
the main proposal is that if we consider the infinite distance limits in F theory on K3 of the complex structure moduli space, then the, these limits should have the following interpretation. On the one hand, there are general weak coupling limits, which are emergent string limits, so weak coupling type of limits. And the remaining infinite distance limits are of the following type according to the proposal. Namely, physically, these are limits where PQ brains enhance the usual Lie algebras to loop algebras. Geometrically, this can be understood as a degeneration as a Kulikov type two or type three model. I, I'll explain what this means. And as a consequence of the appearance of non codira fibers in co dimension one, I'll also explain what this means. And the third, and this is the most important, of course, for us, the interpretation is that these limits are decompactification limits. They can either be decompactification limits from eight dimension to 10 dimensions, eight dimension because I started for simplicity with F theory in K3, or from eight to nine dimensions in the case of type three limits. And the main point, so if you remember nothing else from my talk about this, then the main po point is this third here, namely, even though the complex structure degenerations are extremely complicated to study, the physics interpretation at the end of the day is a very simple one, namely one that is in precise um, agreement with the emergent string conjecture. Either we have the weak coupling limit or, and these are the new types of limits here, we have a decompactification limits either by two dimensions or by one dimension, at least in this case of um, F theory on K3. So now let's see how this comes about. The first um, point of view I'd like to take is via PQ7 brains. Let me give a very brief review. As you all know, um, in F theory, there are PQ strings. So these are bound states of P fundamental strings and QD1 brains, D strings. These can end on PQ7 brains. And once we have a PQ7 brain in our background, then this the, its back reaction induces a SL2Z monodromy. This means that if we transport a say RS string around such a PQ brain, then it will be transformed into a new type of string according to this SL2Z matrix. This is all well, and well known. It's also well known that the, if we put several of these several uh, types of seven brains on top of each other, then we can um, in this way realize um, ADE type Lie algebras. Um, in fact, in, seven, in, in eight dimensions, um, uh, it is sufficient to consider the generating set um, of an A brain, a B brain, a C brain, as discussed in these seminal papers. And their combination then gives rise to ADTE type Lie algebras as the possible non abelian Lie algebras in this type of um, F theory compactifications. And finally, it is also possible to enhance the E type Lie algebra to an F fine Lie algebra to its corresponding F fine Lie algebra hat EN in F theory by adjoining to the adjoining to the set of brains that give rise to, uh, 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 to the eta brains, one extra brain. So this is a rank one enhancement with PQ levels three one. So suppose we start with a configuration of brains that give rise to E type D algebra. And then we consider another brain of PQ level three one and we bring them close together. We can compute the monodromy around this type of configuration, it is easily just computed as the product of monodromy matrices. It takes this upper triangular form. This means that the monodromy matrix has an eigenstate of the form one comma zero. And this in turn means that if we encircle the brains with a one comma zero string, then the string is brought back to itself. So it's a consistent configuration. And uh, this one comma zero string that encircles these two types of brains is a BPS state, in fact, and it becomes massless when the brains come together. A new massless particle signals an extension of the um, symmetry. Um, in this case, an extension of the Lie algebra EN to the affine Lie algebra hat EN, whose simple roots are given apart from the simple roots of the Lie algebra EN by one more root, namely the imaginary root, which is precisely realized by the string delta, which one can encircle and which becomes massless when the brains coalesce. 
So this is an imaginary root which squares to one and which is orthogonal on all the other types of roots. De Wolf et al. Um, explained in detail in uh, a series of papers how this works for the different types of enhancements that you can get by rank one. They also explain based on monodromy that there can be a number of rank two enhancements. But for us, there is in fact only one rank two enhancement that will be geometrically realized. Namely, if in addition to this three one brain, one also brings close a, an A brain to a starting E8 configuration, then one finds a second type of um, 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 possible encircling string, namely the corresponding uh, monodromy of this configuration here is the identity. So both the 1,0 and the 0,1 string can now be encircled around everything. So we get two types of imaginary roots. And this in fact leads to a further enhancement of the hat E8 affine algebra to the loop algebra hat E9, which is the double loop enhancement of E8. So, this is well known. The question I'd like to address now is what the physics interpretation, which types of loop, loop enhancements can occur and how are these realized on elliptic um, K3, uh, K3 manifolds and what does this all have to do with uh, the infinite distance limits on quantum gravity? So first let's look at the physical interpretation. As I said, each um, of the imaginary roots um, that lead to a single or double enhancement corresponds to BPS state. And in fact, closer inspection uh, shows us that it leads not only to a single BPS state, but a whole infinite tower of BPS states. And we can encircle n times and therefore get, get n, uh, a bound state of n, um, um, of n such um, original states. So for each new um, imaginary root, delta one or delta two, if there are two or otherwise just for delta one, one gets one BPS tower of states, which becomes massless as the brains coalesce and sit at one point. So we get infinite towers of states as one has these affine or loop enhancements. And these are precisely the states that are expected from the swamp and distance conjecture at infinite distance in moduli space. So we interpret these enhancements at an enhancement at infinite distance. The BPS towers that one gets in this way, in fact, turn out to be KK modes associated to a decompactification. They are not the decompactification, the decompactification um, it does not happen in the physical frame of F theory that we're looking at, but in a dual frame. So at infinite distance, when this tower becomes light, we should be switching frame to a new physical frame. In fact, they had uh, the dual heterotic frame. And in this dual heterotic frame, this tower of states that becomes light um, is precisely the tower of um, Kaluza Klein states that we would get by decompactif uh, decompactifying the heterotic string from eight either to 10 dimensions or to nine dimensions. More precisely, the affine hat EN enhancements signal decompactification from eight to nine dimensions. Whereas the double loop algebra, there's only one that's unique, is responsible for the full decompactification from eight to 10 dimensions. And this can already be um, uh, seen from the properties of these roots, the fact that the roots square to zero and are also orthogonal on one another. Um, this signals decompactification on S1 times S1, which is precisely the decompactification of the dual heterotic string compact flat in a torus back to 10 dimensions. So this is the physical interpretation. And this is um, um, uh, the, the relation to the infinite distance. So can we make this more precise? Does this actually appear in the geometry and how is it described? And for this now we have to dirty our hands a bit and look at the geometric uh, realization. Um, recall that we are looking at F theory to eight dimensions on a K3 surface. The K3 surface is elliptically fibered. So we can understand it as a Weierstrass model. Um, in other words, we have a varying torus over the physical compactification space. The Weierstrass model is described by the famous Weierstrass sections F and G and uh, the vanishing orders of these, so the types of um, zeros which these functions F and G and the discriminant have um, allow us to read off the type of um, um, non-abelian gauge algebra located at the corresponding points on the base. Um, this is classic knowledge. This is the kodaira neron classification that I'm sure we've all seen. The important point is that this um, classification stops as soon as the vanishing orders of F and G reach or 
exceed the values of four and six. These are non-minimal. And usually the um, um, uh, messages that one should not consider further such degenerations because they are too wild. But the point is, that's the main point of the talk is that these um, non-minimal non codira degenerations in co-dimension one are in fact precisely those which realize the um, appearance of um, the affine or double loop algebras and therefore um, lie at infinite distance in moduli space and have an interpretation as decompactification limits as discussed. Indeed, um, it is known in geometry and physics that such enhancement to um, non codira type fibers require a sequence of blow-ups into so-called Kulikov models. And um, uh, by now studying this geometry, we can try to recover the types of infinite uh, the types of infinite towers of states that we find at infinite distance. And this is the last um, topic that I'd like to, dis uh, to, to, uh, to discuss, namely the relation between these geometric degenerations at infinite distance and um, these towers of states um, um, uh, that, uh, that we saw um, in the PQ brain language. So mathematically, just to set the notation a bit, we are considering a family of K3 surfaces. So these are now our K3 surfaces, which we want to degenerate. So we're looking at a limit in complex structure moduli space where the K3 surface degenerates in such a way that, for example, we get these high vanishing orders in the Weierstrass model. And um, um, th there are a particular type of um, uh, degenerations, which are called semi-stable. Let me just tell you that these have been studied uh, in great detail in the mathematics. Uh, and in fact, by a general uh, theorem, every such degeneration can be brought into semi-stable form, meaning that the degenerate K3 um, essentially looks like this. So it's, a, it's a, um, an, an intersection of various components um, um, with semi-stable properties. The details are not so important for us. What is important for us is that um, um, one can ensure that these semi-stable degenerations are um, of a particular type, namely they fall into the, into the list of Kulikov models without loss of, generations, uh, of generality. One can assume this. And these in turn have been classified in the math literature as type one, type two, and type three. The Kulikov type one models, these lie at finite distance in moduli space, so they play no role for us. The Kulikov type two and type three models, these are the relevant ones, because this is where the infinite distance limits occur. Namely, Kulikov type two um, means that the different components of our K3s intersect, uh, they intersect in tori. This is the important point. Whereas Kulikov type three means that the intersection structure can be more complicated and the surfaces that do intersect might intersect in rational curves. And this in fact is um, at the heart of this distinction between the double loop algebra and the loop algebra. Namely, let's quickly look at um, type two, um, type two models. For these, it is known in the geometry that um, there exists asymptotically um, 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 of vanishing volume tori in the geometry. Um, this means that, um, that there exists certain um, 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 uh, tori whose calibrated volume goes to zero. This means in turn, from an M-theory perspective, if we, if we wrap M2 brains um, on these tori, then we expect towers of mass states. And these are in general, a subset of the asymptotically mass states at infinite distance. But what is the origin of these, um, of these two tori whose, whose volume becomes massless and the interpretation of the states? Well, for type two models, the, um, for, for this, we have to dig deeper into the geometry. And in fact, for type two models, um, one knows that there are only two types of such, of such models, the type two A and the type two B model. The type two A models, um, we know already from the work of Morris and Buffer in the physics literature, the type two B models from, um, from the uh, recoupling limits in the type 2a models, what's happening is that our K3 at infinite distance um, becomes a pair of intersecting D9, uh, DP9 surfaces. This is an elliptic vibration over P1. They intersect over a torus. This was type 2, if you recall. And now one can um, look at the geometry explicitly and finds um, the possibility to fiber one cycle's 
in the elliptic fiber over a shrinking one cycle on the base. This can happen twice. So there are two such um, vibrations, two two tori. Um, M theory, um, um, if we compactify um, M2 brains on these tor uh, two tori, we get uh, corresponding um, towers of Martian states. And these in turn are precisely the, uh, uh, the same states that we get by um, encircling one zero or zero one strings um, in the F theory section. So um, the claim is that um, in these DP9 um, surfaces, um, what gets two towers of states, which are precisely the two towers that were responsible for the enhancement from E8, say, to head E9. And this is um, the hallmark of the compactification from eight to 10 dimensions. Please slowly move to the conclusions, please. Okay, if you give me just two more minutes, then, then I'm done, because this is now the, 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 the last point. There are also the type three models and this is now where the, where, where the um, mathematically um, more difficult um, uh, classification comes in. In this situation, one has only a single um, uh, two torus which emerges and two brains wrapping this two torus gives rise to one tower of states. This one tower of state would be precisely the one responsible for decompactification from eight to nine dimension and be in one to one corresponding uh, correspondent to the enhancement um, um, once we uh, once we go from say E8 to, to head E8, uh, excuse me, from, from EN to head EN, so, um, so, so, so the affine, um, the affine enhancement. And um, in fact, um, now, so, so, so the upshot is we've now um, this, uh, we, 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 we have now found a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, um, uh, three, three pictures. On the one hand, the possible affine enhance, uh, enhancements for PQ brains. On the other hand, these complicated uh, uh, Kulikov models. And third, the physical interpretation um, of um, uh, towers of states at infinite distance um, being that of a decompactification. I don't have time to, to discuss this, but in order to, um, um, uh, to explain um, this physical interpretation, one has to look at the heterotic dual and um, indeed uh, check that these limits, the type two and type three limits indeed correspond to 10 dimensional or nine dimensional decompactifications. And as a side remark, um, this approach can also be used to now classify possible maximal non-abelian gauge groups in nine dimensions and um, the results that come out from this geometric analysis are in perfect agreement with a heterotic analysis uh, by these models. Okay, let me summarize. The main point was that I wanted to provide further evidence for the emergent string conjecture. The emergent string conjecture states that every infinite distance limit in a quantum gravity theory should either lead to a dual weakly coupled string theory or be a decompactification limit. This is a refinement of the swampland distance conjecture. It has been confirmed in various setups involving Keller moduli, and there was a rich interplay between the geometry and the physical understanding of these limits. In this talk, I um, indicated how to extend this to quote unquote open string moduli spaces in, in F theory. The correct word would be to say for the complex structure moduli of elliptic K3 surfaces. And um, the main proposal is that there are two types of limits at infinite distance. Those limits which lead to an affine or loop enhancement of some of the algebras. This has an interpretation as a dual decompactification limit to nine or 10 dimensions. And we identified the physical origin of the BPS towers and um, um, claim that they have an interpretation of Kalusa Klein states. What I did not discuss much in this talk, but which uh, for completeness, we also have to keep in mind, there are also the recoupling limits. They also fall into this framework of um, uh, type two and type three Kulikov models. And these are emergent string limits. So in this sense, the uh, mathematics of uh, degenerations of K3 surfaces indeed is in agreement with the physical expe expectations based on um, the swampland um, conjecture. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Timo, for this very interesting and clear talk. Um, before we start question, uh, questions, I should mention that Mario Martone has shown up and will give us a talk, probably a bit shorter, but let's have some questions for Timo.
questions online. I guess it was very clear, too clear. <laughs> so let's thank you again. Okay. Hey, we thank switch. you. Thank you very much. So, so we switched two talks, and now it will be Mario Martone from Tony Cook. Yes. <clears throat> so can I, can I activate the video or? Um... Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. We can activate the video, right? You're working on it. And could I ask you to keep your talk a little bit shorter because otherwise we run into the next session? Okay, great. Oh, well. So. Let me just uh, share the video. Okay, great. So I will now share. Okay, again, can you see me? Can you see my face? Okay, great. So let me just share now the video. Yeah. Like no also. You, you should you should be able to see it also the, the slides. Yeah, beautiful. So, okay, thank you so much. So first of all, I would like to uh, sincerely apologize to everybody for being late. And Timo, I I thank you so much for taking my place. I made a I made a a, a, a change a mistake in uh, converting the time and uh, a partial excuse that I became a father a little over a week ago. So I'm a little bit off uh, schedule. But again, I, I really apologize and thank you so much for letting me talk anyway. So I'll try to, to give just a sense of something that uh, is a work in progress, but uh, has already appeared uh, one, one paper on it uh, just um, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, this is on the, on the question of classifying superconformal field theory, specifically in four dimensions. So the, talk, the title of the talk is Characteristic Dimension and Isotrivial Geometries. And Basically, the gist of it is the introduction of this notion of characteristic dimension. Can you actually see my pointer as well? Yes, we can. Okay. So again, uh, let me uh, try to motivate it briefly. So the, the idea is that we want to try to explore the space of quantum field theories. And in particular, we can start by uh, studying uh, conformal field theories for, for two reasons. One is because it's much easier to classify conformal field theories because of the symmetry existing in the problem. Secondly, is because basically CFTs can be thought of fixed points. And so we can think of like exploring the whole space of QFTs by starting from CFTs and then exploring RG flows between them. Now, even just classifying conformal field theories uh, while much easier than classifying general QFTs, it's quite of a challenging problem. And so you add, what do you do in physics? If, if there is a, pro you try to kind of study the, the closest problem, the closest model that you can still solve that is close to, to reality. And that is basically adding extra symmetries to simplify your life. So one of the things that you can do is to add supersymmetry to conformal invariance and go to the super conformal uh, setup which are much more constrained. And so the question that I'm trying to pose today and, uh, and you know, it's been part of my research program for a while is that, is it possible to develop a bottom-up approach to classify what is allowed? Um, now, one of the facts that probably most of the people are familiar with in the audience is that more overwhelmingly, uh, uh, super conformal field theories are non-Lagrangian. So you have to really develop different tools to, um, to ask the, the questions of classification that goes way beyond, uh, they go way beyond um, the standard kind of quantum field theoretic uh, notions. And I'm gonna argue that geometry is indeed uh, the way to go. And uh, one of the things that really, the approach that, that I'm trying to propose uh, gives you is the fact that it gives you a handle on the notion of completeness. So it's not just that you can come up with a list of new theories supposedly, but you can, try to gauge how complete your understanding is. Now, what, I'm, what I'll be arguing is that the ideal scenario to, to perform this bottom-up classification is four-dimensional and equal to 
theories. So why is that? And I want to justify that uh, since, since basically everybody that is in this field knows very well that uh, the higher you are in dimensions, the simpler the problem is. That can be understood by the fact, by understanding that if you give a quantum field theory or conform a field theory in given dimensions, in general, from one, one theory in one dimension, there's many different ways to, to compactify and obtain uh, theories of the similar kind, either conformal or superconformal in lower dimensions. So each, each theory in higher dimensions gives rise to many theories in lower dimensions. So you want to try to classify the highest possible dimensions because that's the, the problem is simplest. Now, the, the highest possible dimensions in which you can have superconformal invariants, that's well-known result, is six dimensional. So you might believe that the ideal setup in which you can do this classification is in six dimensions. Now, why am I claiming instead that you want to go all the way down to 4D? Well, this is, this is due to the fact that if you study the R symmetry of these theories in six or let's say in five dimension, you have this curious thing that the R symmetry seems almost the same in every dimension, but there's a one small difference. There is this extra U1 that appears in four dimensions. Now, this extra U1 is key because it gives you an action it's spontaneously broken on some uh, branch of the modular space of vacuum and gives you an action on the geometry that we are trying to, to classify that's constraining it tremendously. Roughly speaking, this is, this is a consequence on the fact that there is the so-called tensor or coulomb branch in six and, four, in, in six and five dimensions, it's a real uh, space. Whereas in four dimension it becomes complex. And so it carries an actions of a new one you want on it. And so, Everybody knows that complex dimension is quite more, much more constrained than the real dimensions. And that's that really why we want to start from 4D. Not because, you know, there is an extra complication uh, due to the fact that we are lower than six dimension, but there is extra constraints because of complex geometry. So the goal of, of the program is to understand the structure of the modular space of vacuum. That's where the geometry comes about. And uh, I will be a little bit more specific in a minute. And, uh, and from that, kind of classifying from bottom up all possible geometries that can be interpreted as modular space of vacuum of super conformal field theories of appropriate kind. And then kind of reverse engineer, once we, we complete this classification of geometries that are allowed, you reverse engineer the question and thus um, seeing the, the, every single geometry that can be interpreted as a modular space of vacuum of an SCFT as an evidence of the existence of the so uh, you know the the given CFD. Um, the main result of of the of the what I'm going to present is that um, there are extremely simple uh, criteria that you can come up with that gives you kind of general they they kind of give you a block of understanding of the general structure of Coulomb branch of n equal two CFDs for any rank. And those are the ICO trivial cases, which I will, uh, will, uh, will uh, kind of introduce in, towards the end of the talk. But the, the gist of it is that really, you know, by being clever in your analysis and being understanding of how the R symmetry acts and so forth, you can really come up with general criteria that give you a handle for classifying modular space of vacuum of, of generic R, generic ranks of, uh, of N equal to a CFD. So that's the plan of my talk. I'll go quick. How much time do I have uh, just to get a sense from now on so that I can try to be on time? So we're trying to finish at six o'clock our time. Okay, so 20 minutes, is that right? 19, okay, great. So I'll have plenty of that. So I will try to introduce the, more systematically the modular space of vacuum and then, and then uh, give you a sense of what has been done already. Some of the people in the audience might already be very familiar with those results. Uh, you know, so we'll, I will explain what, what, what the analysis have of the, the simplest possible scenario, the so-called rank one case, then go, move on into the, the next simplest case, which is still open, and then introduce really these powerful new tools that I just uh, hinted towards uh, the, the end of my introduction. Great. So what is the special modular space of vacuum? By modular space of vacuum, I just uh, mean, or we all mean, uh, the set of of, uh, of ground states of a given theory. So the, the a theory, uh, given QFT is said to have a modular space of vacuum if the set of ground states is actually continuous, is not finite. And therefore, if, if there are continuous vacuum that are allowed, you are led to interpret 
the, the vacuum expedition values, the continuous vacuum expedition values of those fields as coordinates on some geometric space, which is in fact what we call the modular space of vacuum. Now for, for the specific set of theories that I'm interested in, that is n equal to SCFTs in four dimension, the general uh, setup of the modular space of vacuum has this, uh, this form in, as you can see in the figure. That is, you have three different types of, of branches or sub, subspaces of, the modular, of this big modular space of vacuum, which are called the mixed branch, the Higgs branch, and the Coulomb branch. They all intersect with one another, and they have a very complicated, in general, this is a very complicated space of very, very high dimensional, uh, high dimension. Um, what, what, just to get, to get a sense of what those are for n equal to super, uh, supersymmetry, um, in general, n equal to supersymmetry, for at least when you are restricted to a Lagrangian case, that has a vector multiplet uh, and a hypermultiplet. The vector multiplet, if you talk in terms of n equal one uh, language, it's just an n equal one vector plus an n equal one coil. The n equal one coil uh, has the feature that contains a complex scalars in it, and, and scalar fields are the ones that usually are easier to uh, to get a value without breaking Lorentz invariance. Therefore, and then anytime you have a vector multiplet in n equal two supersymmetry, you expect that the, the, the corresponding scalar gets a VEV. And that actually it happens generically. So we believe that n equal two supersymmetric theories always have a modular space of vacuum. That's why this method is particularly useful. And we call the set of, of, of vacua of the scalar of the vector multiplet the Coulomb branch. That's what uh, characterizes the subspace of the bigger space of vacuum. The so-called, this is the gauge part because the vector multiplet corresponds to the, the vector bosons that, that carry kind of the, the gauge, uh, the gauge uh, uh, quantum numbers. Now, you can also then discuss the hypermultiplet. The hypermultiplet instead in n equal one language is just two chiral super, uh, two chiral super fields. So here you have not just one uh, complex scalars, but you have two complex scalars. And uh, the two can acquire generically a VEV forming the Higgs branch. And the fact that you have two complex scalars it, it relates to the fact that the Higgs branch is in general uh, carries integer quaternionic dimension, not just complex dimension. But we will not discuss Higgs branches that much in this talk. So those are the kind of the brief uh, characterization of these two branches. So for example, in, if you have an SU2 gauge theory, uh, you can you can convince yourself that the complex scalar of the vector multiplet can acquire a VEV that is parameterized by just a single complex number, phi and minus phi. And therefore, in this case, for SU2, the Coulomb branch is one complex dimension. You can also convince yourself that in this case, uh, once you turn on this phi, your SU2 gauge theory breaks to an AU1 gauge theory. You know, you can generalize what you've learned in this, uh, in the, in the SU2 setup to define general features of Coulomb branches of n equal to SCFDs. Point number one, you see that in the case of SU2, SU2 is the rank one gauge, uh, gauge group. And in this case, we, we convince ourselves that the, the, the scalar of the vector multiplet can just, can, the, the, the VEV of the scalar is parameterized by just one complex dimension. So the complex dimensionality of the of this uh, Coulomb branch corresponds to the rank of the gauge group. Then we elevate this feature to a definition of the rank for theories which do not have a gauge theory description, and so we define the rank of a, an SCFTs as the dimension, the complex dimension of the Coulomb branch. Similarly, as we said that once you turn on this this VEV that you can uh, that is allowed for the complex scalar. It, the, the gauge theory breaks to from SU2 to U1. We generalize that by saying that in the generic point of this R-dimensional Coulomb branch, the effective low energy description is just the U1 to the R gauge theory. And you see that in order to define this Lagrangian, there is extra data, which is this tau IJ that defines an actual metric on your space. And then the interesting feature is this Lagrangian that describes this effective U1 to the R description is not unique and introduces monodromes. So the, the general feature that you have is that you are dealing with an R complex dimensional space where there is a non-trivial metric given by this tau IJ, which is up, happens to be Kähler. Not only that, but there are lines here which are special 
there are basically where there are some interesting uh, non-trivial singularity. And if you loop around those lines, the, the Lag Lagrangian changes and picks up special monodromy transformation. So you have this very complicated uh, feature that allows you to really then um, ask the questions, what are the possible spaces which are allowed all this interesting uh, kind of mathematical structure? And is it possible to classify them from the bottom up? Just to give you a sense of the power of the, of the problem at hand, one of the things you can discuss about this, of these geometries is that you can discuss the scaling dimensions of the, of the coordinates of this space. You said this is our complex dimensional space. These are complex dimensional uh, things are identified as web or some operators of your, of your conformal, of conformal theory. And therefore you can ask, uh, what are the scaling dimensions of these operators whose webs are the coordinates? And therefore, what are the scaling dimensions of the coordinates? Those are the type of questions that people ask when they try to, uh, to, to classify conformal field theories. In general, it's very complicated to, to give an answer. In this setup, you can actually come up with a close formula. This is, is a little bit involved, but if you actually spend a few minutes thinking about it, you'll see that it's very simple. And there's a close formula that given the complex dimensionality of the space tells you exactly what are the allowed scaling dimensions. And you find that not only they are all rationals, but they're bound both from below and from above. Those are the type of questions or, or type of answers that is really hard to obtain uh, in absence of supersymmetry. And here you can really make progress. And this is was found by myself and Philip Rogers in 2018, along with Sergio Caorsi, uh, Matteo Caorsi and Sergio Ducati. Now, we want to go beyond this, this, uh, this uh, kind of general features. And in particular, for example, in the case of rank one, where the, there is a single job, the single complex dimension column branch, you can really come up with a complete classification to what are the allowed uh, possibilities. This is, a, this is now a pretty old result. It's about five years old. And this is, this is the table you can come up with. So it's a, just one table that allows you to uh, identify what are all the possible options. To give you a sense of why this approach is particularly useful is that by the time we come up with this table, and it's, this is a, a problem, you know, the question of what are the rank one and equal to CFDs was an open question for many years and many, many very smart people have thought about it. And for when the, at, the point, at, the, at the moment when we, when, when we uh, uh, presented our classification, only the theories in, in, the, in, the, yellow, in the red box was uh, were known uh, in, for example, in, in F theory. And we discussed, for example, this thing with Timo uh, extensively in trying to understand what happened to in F theory for the other, whether or not there was an F theory realizations of the other theories that we had found. So the fact that we were able to identify new theories really you know, started a lot, of, a lot of discussion. And by now, and basically thanks to this, this uh, very interesting developments, we have an F theory realizations of all but one. So we really, you know, we really, by giving a bottom-up approach, we really kind of can ask uh, kind of deep, of course, it's much narrower in terms of reach. We're going much slower than, for example, many string theory approaches, but the completeness of the, of the, of the, of the approach really gives, gives a lot of fruits. So what happens in rank two? Well, in rank two, I recently came up with, uh, you know, a catalog of what is known, and you can see that already by just staring at it, it's much more complicated. So things are becoming much more complicated. And then you can ask, okay, it's, it's definitely Richard, but do, you, do, we know, do we know anything about whether or not what we have seen so far is complete? And again, I wanna make it clear that the, if, if we discover new theories from the bottom up, we could possibly, this can possibly lead to many new, new developments, including new string theory constructions or or new compactification uh, ways of compactifying higher dimensional theory. So do we have any sense of whether or not the current understanding of rank two is complete? Well, there's a lot to say, but given that I have a lot of limited amount of time, I'll just tell you just some, some interesting um, uh, kind of experimental evidence that the, uh, the, the current understanding is, is not complete. In fact, for example, you can restrict to the case of n equal to three SFTs. Those are, this is a very fairly recent development, um, which are nearly maximum supersymmetric. So they are much easier to us to classify than just n equal two theories. And, uh, and the, the modular space of vacuum, the coulomb branches is much more constrained because they're just um, orbifolds of, of, of affine complex spaces. And so you can ask, 
do we know at least what are the, the, the rank two and equal three theories and, uh, and have we discovered them all? The way you can ask this question is by going into the details of how you construct these orbital spaces. So that's, that's, that's the, mo the modular space of vacuum of these n equal three theories. That's a general, uh, generic, form, generic form. And it's just C to the three R where R is the rank mod by a gamma, which is a specific uh, finite group. So you are, because you're writing this way, you're mapping your, your question of classifying modular space of vacuum to a question of classifying uh, specific finite groups. Those are so-called principally polarized crystallographic complex regression groups. They're complicated, but they are fully classified by mathematicians. And then you can take the list of all the groups which uh, match those conditions and, uh, they, and they give you a rank in act on C6. So they give you a rank two theory and ask whether or not we know uh, by string theory constructions or otherwise, all, all the theories that, that are obtained this way. And then it's very simple that indeed, we only we have only realized two of, of many examples. So there is at least five examples in total. So there is at least new, three new uh, examples which have not been realized. So again, this really suggests that there's a lot more to learn even in rank two. Okay. Um, now, just to, in the last five minutes, I want to give you, so, so far, I'm giving you the sense that basically rank one has been completely classified and this complete classification has done a whole lot, uh, much more than probably uh, we even expected. In rank two, we have started the classification and we realized that even though we are in very, in very good shape, sorry, um, there is still a lot that is not known. But now I want to just introduce a notion, which is the notion of characteristic dimensions, that really gives you a sense of um, of, of some tools that allow you to um, to classify theories for a generic rank, not rank by, by rank by rank, but at least a subclass uh, for any rank up to. Um. So, the, the, to to add this, to introduce this new uh, notion, I have to go back to the notion of Coulomb branch in a little more detail. Remember this picture in which this is the art complex dimensional space and there are these lines that represent singularities where extra masses uh, charge states uh, become part of the spectrum. And, uh, and, and there are some particular, and they're described not just by U1 to the R as in the generic point, but some non-trivial um, uh, physics. So this structure gives rise to what is called the, class, the stratification of the Coulomb branches. And again, uh, th that classification should be consistent with the properties of, of Coulomb branch, which I introduced previously. The fact that the rank is the dimension, complex dimensionality of the Coulomb branch. Uh, the effective theories is U1 to the R and so forth and so on. Okay, great. So the way you, you analyze this, it's by, by identifying the tau j, which is the metric on a generic point of the Coulomb branch, as um, basically arising from, um, from, the, uh, from an abelian variety, from a geometric, realizing the tau j geometrically in terms of vibration of abelian varieties. And so you're really kind of going back from, you're mapping the full problem of understanding the modular space of vacuum in terms of, of geometric uh, data. Now, this, this, this vibration of abelian variety is really gives you a hit on how to think about the problem in generic rank. Let me just try to, to give you a sense of what you can do. So consider a rank R SCFT. This is, it's basically means that it has an R complex dimensional Coulomb branch. And each one of these R, com, uh, each one of this R complex coordinates carries a particular scaling dimensions delta I. I gave you a close formula to compute those scaling dimensions. Now, these ones are rational numbers, and you can rewrite the set of R dimensional or R rational numbers in terms of one overall lambda times integers, right? Because those are rational numbers, lambda is just a rational number itself. And as I said, these DIs have the properties that those are natural numbers and they're Gs and they're mutually prime. Now, I define the characteristic dimension as one over one over lambda mod one, okay? So this is just a definition, it's extremely simple definition. You factorize this one lamb, lamb, overall lambda such that everything is, is integer and you get a number. Now the incredible things 
that you can show is that this characteristic dimension for any, any n equal to SCFTs can only take one of these six values, one, six, five, four thirds, three halves, two, three, four, and six. And if kappa is not one or two, then th this metric has to be necessarily constant over the entire Coulomb branch, and the BPS spectrum is dramatically constrained. Furthermore, the, the, the type of theories that should describe the mass spectrum it's, are not, cannot be IF-free theories. And the abelian variety for those, you know, I'm sure Timo and everybody else that does a lot of geometric engineering understands it very and string theory compactification understands it very well, the, the, the abelian variety has a, an extremely special form. It factorizes in terms of, of, of uh, a product of, um, of tori of you know, rank one abelian variety. So this rank R abelian variety that becomes an incredibly special, uh, special, uh, special form that uh, factorizes uh, uh, rank one abelian varieties. And not only that, but it's very special values of the complex um, moduli of the torus, which is given by the specific value of the characteristic dimension. Okay, since we are, uh, we are out of time, uh, let me just tell you that this, this type of theories are very well known. So the theories which have characteristic dimensions not equal to one or two are those that are, can be obtained as a world volume theories on the three brains probing seven brain singularities or the asphalt. But the question is now we have a tool because we understand them geometrically from the bottom up. We, we, we have a way to ask, is this, is, are this a very special and theoretic construction, the ones that can be obtained by a bunch of D3 brains probing a single seven brain singularity, the only ones that give rise to it, this extremely um, constrained setup. Okay. To summarize, there's a lot to learn from a careful analysis of modular space geometries of four-dimensional theories, and in particular on the Coulomb branch. And it's possible, it's definitely possible, and in fact, we're doing it, uh, that uh, a classification of rank two theories and in particular, we understand now that there are criteria that can be uh, developed. They're not only apply to uh, rank by rank, but it gives you a sense and a handle on a classification for all rank. Thank you, and I apologize again uh, for, for making a mistake in the timing. And I wanna thank again, Timo and the organizers for being patient. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the interesting talk and uh, thanks for perfectly keeping the new time. Let's see if there's questions. This is for George. Sorry? Yeah, hello. Uh, George Lupanos uh, uh, here. Uh, sorry that I missed a few minutes in the beginning of your talk, so I did not uh, uh, realize exactly what was the target. But uh, uh, maybe uh, I will tell you a couple of comments that in case you are looking for n equal uh, two theories, uh, which are finite and super conformal and so on, uh, all the SUN with a fundamental uh, N, for instance, they are uh, finite. Um, uh, I'm not sure if this adds anything to your classification. This is uh, well known. Of course, you can take uh, how, how do you prove that? Okay. You're saying for any rank, it, there's a finite number of n equal to SCFTs? Any, any n equal to with SUN uh, gauge theory and mental representation is finite, uh, is finite all of this perturbation theory. Then you can uh, extend it to the exceptional things uh, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, the, the real point is that none of them for the moment can be done, uh, can be constructed to, to, to be realistic because uh, they are non chiral right? They have a mirror spectrum and uh, unless we find a mechanism to make the mirror world heavier than the, uh, the chiral one, uh, none of them is realistic. But maybe uh, what is more important <laughs> is to say that, uh, of course, I don't comment about N equal four, which are all uh, uh, super conformal. But uh, I think from uh, the physics point of view, uh, uh, the N equal one uh, theories have been classified also in uh, uh, 84 or something like that by Schwartz and uh, others, Hamidi and uh, uh, 
and I forget the other name of it. Uh, very in some cases, you're talking about Lagrangian, though, right? Sorry. You're yeah. talking about the Lagrangian setup. I agree with the Lagrangian setup, yes. But uh, overwhelmingly, the SC, the super conformal field theories are non Lagrangians, and that's where the the interesting features lie. Yeah. So okay. that's. Uh, Okay, let me tell you this because maybe you don't know. And then, uh, and the final thing that I, I wanted to tell you what uh, is this that n equal one finite theories, which are Lagrangian, of course, uh, theories, have been classified for all the uh, classical and exceptional groups. And out of all of them, we have constructed a long time ago an n equal one SG5 uh, theory, which predicted correctly. Uh, first the mass of the top quark and then the mass of the Higgs, just for completeness of this discussion. Okay, thank you. Oh, I guess that was more of a comment. Um, looking at the time, I guess we should thank you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So I would suggest that we stick with the original schedule and have a short coffee break and we'll continue at 6 then. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Can you hear me? Well, I thought I might just try uh, sharing my slide. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yep, that's perfect. You have your microphone muted so I can hear you. I'm sorry. Did you hear me? No, no, no. You're perfect. Good. Do you see my pointer? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it seems to be working. Uh, excellent. So let me stop sharing. Okay. So uh, it's supposed to start at 10? Yep. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. So uh, five minutes, I guess. Correct.
All right, welcome to the last session of this uh, workshop. It has been a quick mix up of chairperson, so I'm the chairperson again. Uh, hello, Hiroshi. Would you like to share it? Hi, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know where, which time zone you are. Uh, I can share the screen. Our well, first speaker will be Hiroshi Ogori from Caltech, talking on completeness of gauge charges and quantum gravity. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to give a talk at uh, Fumboldt Collegue. Uh, since uh, this is a Fumboldt Collegue, I thought that uh, I might say a few words about my experience with Fumboldt Award. And uh, this has to do with symmetry because uh, uh, this is what I'd be interested in talking today. So, so I received this Fumboldt Award to 2000. Nine, and it was a very nice uh, ceremony. Uh, we enjoyed it very much. And the next year, uh, I spent a few months uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Potsdam, uh, Albert Einstein Institute, hosted by Hamann Nikolai. And uh, I had a, uh, we had a great experience. And uh, one of the things I did while over there was to finish my work uh, on what is now called machine moonshine, uh, finding out some evidence for existence of a uh, uh, large finite group symmetry in the BPS, quota BPS sector uh, of uh, nonlinear schema, two dimensional nonlinear schema model with K3 target space. So this is now called machine moonshine. So this was one of the things that I did uh, during my humble, uh, sorry, Humboldt stay uh, in Potsdam. The other experience I had with uh, uh, this uh, Humboldt uh, uh, award was that uh, in the 2009 uh, award ceremony, uh, actually uh, I was with uh, Ludwig Fadif. Uh, he also received the uh, uh, award uh, at the same time. Uh, so it was very humbling experience to be with him. And uh, so I was talking to him and he found out that I'm from Caltech. And he said that uh, some years ago, uh, he saw a huge folder of Feynman's note on Vete Ansatz, and he wanted to find out what Feynman was interested in knowing. So that was my assignment at the uh, ceremony. So, so I went back to Caltech. At Caltech, we have actually a big archive where a uh, collection of notes and papers uh, of uh, some of the prof uh, past professors are collected. So in the case of Feynman, there are like 20 boxes. So I went through the boxes and found some some notes about Betty and that, but it was just a few sheets of paper like this, rather than a huge folder that uh, uh, Fadev was telling me about. So actually, uh, it, it is true that Fe uh, Feynman was interested in Betty and that. This is a, uh, a photo of his last blackboard, and Betty and that was indeed uh, one of his to-do list. And so next year, when I was visiting, uh, uh, Max Planck Institute in Potsdam. Uh, I was invited to give a seminar in Freie University in Berlin. And Fadev was visiting, so I, I met him again. And uh, I um, told him about uh, uh, the result of my homework exercise. And he said, no, 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 no. He, I did see this huge folder. So, so I had to go back to Caltech and still try to find out. And uh, several years later, 2018, uh, there was a five-month centennial, and so there are several events. And so I took that opportunity to contact some of five months uh, late students and uh, eventually found out about the folder and where it is and what was in it. So, so this is a long story, so I, I will not have time to tell you about. Uh, unfortunately, by the time I found out uh, Fadev passed away, he passed away in 2017, but uh, uh, I did finish his assignment about finding out what Feynman was doing with the beta angles. So maybe uh, I will tell you about that on the next occasion. So today uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, uh, the relation between Swampland and the symmetry of quantum gravity. So Swampland question, uh, so Timo Weinland uh, gave a very nice talk earlier today about uh, uh, the distance conjecture and their generalization and the refinement uh, in uh, the context of string theory. So this is a general question that uh, suppose somebody give you effective theory of gravity, then uh, how can you tell whether this is actually realizable as low energy effective theory 
of consistent quantum gravity with, with uh, ultraviolet completion. Okay, so that's a question. So try to come up with some kind of criteria for consistency. Okay, so by now there are, also by the way, I wanted to mention, this is I learned from uh, Aaron Party that evidently Albert Einstein was the first person uh, to suggest something like that, that he pointed out that not everything is possible in a modern language in the low energy effective theory, but there are certain constraints that one has uh, for uh, low energy effective theory of consistent uh, uh, unified theory in his point of view. So this was written in his autographical note, autobiographical note. So by now, uh, there are uh, uh, actually a variety of uh, 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 Swampland conjectures. So I, I call that the landscape of Swampland conditions. So, so there are a variety of conditions. Some conditions are very useful uh, in constraining low energy theory, but they tend to be rather speculative. And those that are rigorous tend to be not very useful. And uh, so the, 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 uh, I think the goal of the program would be to move this conjecture towards this corner, which is uh, both useful and rigorous. So today uh, I'd like to tell you about these two conjectures, which are sort of among these conjectures uh, most well established. And in some cases have proof in the context of ADS CFT correspondence. So, so in this talk today, uh, I'd like to do two things. Uh, one is uh, to review uh, the area derivation of these conjectures, no global symmetry and completeness hypothesis. I will tell you what these are uh, in the context of ads CFT correspondence. So these are, this is actually my work with Daniel Harrow about three years ago, uh, where we established uh, these two statements. Uh, I think uh, as rigorously as possible in the context of ads CFT correspondence. Uh, of course, ads CFT correspondence is not a rigorous mathematical statement, so we can't give, com give complete mathematical proof of this, but we gave uh, as rigorous as possible with the current knowledge of ads CFT correspondence. These two statements for uh, any uh, quantum theory gravity where ADS CFT correspondence applies. So this is, I would like to uh, briefly review uh, because this is, uh, uh, so we will build on this. So, so today I would like to uh, give a new derivation of uh, the completeness of gauge charges uh, in the case when uh, a gauge group is finite group. But in this case, actually we can give more detailed structure of how these gauge charges are distributed in the Hilbert space, uh, how they appear in the, uh, especially in a high energy limit of the Hilbert space. So, and this is based on Euclidean uh, quantum, theory, quantum gravity formulation. So this is actually the work that we recently completed and posted on the archive a couple of weeks ago. So, so I would like to report uh, on, on, on this result. So that's my talk. So first I'd like to uh, review uh, what we did uh, for both uh, absence of global symmetry and completeness uh, in the context of ADS GFT correspondence. So uh, in order to prove absence of global symmetry, uh, we use uh, ADS GFT correspondence relation between quantum gravity and antiliter space and conformal field theory on the boundary. And uh, uh, there are two important ideas and I'd like to spell them out. One is that uh, when we talk about the gauge symmetry in the, uh, sorry, we are talking about the global symmetry. Well, we are going to show that uh, there is no such thing as global symmetry uh, in uh, quantum theory gravity. So, uh, so when we talk about symmetry, uh, uh, we would, would like to spell out some of the property. So one important property of uh, symmetry uh, in uh, local quantum field theory is that you have so-called generalized nature theory. So, so I'd like to tell you about this. And then the other tool that we are going to, going to prove this statement is uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction. So, so we'd like to uh, make use of these two. So first, uh, generalized nature theory. Okay, so suppose you have quantum field theory. So conformal field theory is an example of quantum field theory. So this applies to a symmetry of conformal field theory on the boundary. So suppose you have a quantum field theory so it's, be, uh, it's described in terms of a configuration of field on the Cauchy surface. 
and Hamiltonian tell you how this evolved in time. Okay, so suppose you have symmetry, then on the co uh, Cauchy surface, uh, you can define unitary operator acting in the Hilbert space uh, for er every element of symmetry group. That's how we learn about global symmetry of quantum field theory, right? But there is actually more than that. So suppose, for example, uh, you have continuous uh, global symmetry, but then by the Neta theorem, uh, you have conserved the current. And uh, uh, this unitary operator can be ex expressed as exponential of uh, charges associated to this Neta current. And charge is given by integral of Neta current. So that's a uh, sort of Neta theorem. And in that case, uh, this has a, a very interesting property that is of this type. So suppose you have a, a Cauchy surface and suppose you divide the Cauchy surface into subregions, and, the, and the, they are disjoint, but then if they take your union, then it covers the original uh, Cauchy surface. Suppose you divide the uh, Cauchy surface in this way. So then you can write R as union of these subspaces. Then uh, what you can show is that uh, uh, this unitary operator, which is the same as this or original unitary operator, is actually a product of uh, unitary operator acting on each subregion. So this is actually obvious uh, uh, in the case of continuous group that I just mentioned, because U is uh, exponential of neta charge. A neta charge is an integral of neta current over this subregion, over this region. So therefore, if you divide the region into subregion, the neta charge becomes sum of neta charges associated to each of these regions. And therefore, if you exponentiate it, it becomes product. So therefore, uh, this is obvious for continuous symmetry. But it turns out that uh, for most quantum field theory satisfying a rather reasonable condition in the context of algebraic quantum field theory, uh, you can prove this as a theory. So even for finite group, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a true statement. Uh, you, you ha we have to formulate it a little bit more rigorously, but basically, essentially, uh, the statement is like that, that uh, if you have a symmetry group and if you divide the Cauchy surface into segment, then the symmetry unitary operator associated symmetry becomes product of unitary operators associated to each of these regions. Okay. So this is one statement we can use. Because we assume that the, the, we are talking about symmetry and we are talking about symmetry of both conformal field theory and the gravity, gravity theory. So we apply this to conformal field theory. So that's one uh, uh, knowledge that we have. So that's one of the two things. So the other thing is entanglement with reconstruction. So this is some ideas that have been developed for the last 15 years after Ryu Takanagi. Uh, a conjecture of entanglement entropy. So the idea is this. So, so if you have ADS CFT correspondence, then everything that is happening inside of bounds data space can be stated as uh, some fact about conformal field theory on the boundary. But uh, you can have more refined statements. So suppose you have subregion on the boundaries, which I call A. And then uh, for, for this region, you can define a Ryu Takayanagi surface. Ryu Takayanagi surface is a minimum surface extended into the bulk of ABS, subtending on the boundary of A. So you have this Ryu Takayanagi surface. Then you can consider a, a subspace of this Cauchy slice uh, bounded by a Ryu Takayanagi surface and the original boundary. So you can, you can have uh, this, this kind of space. Uh, well, one of the uh, uh, condition for Ryu Takayanagi surface is that it's homologically uh, equivalent to A. So there is indeed always uh, such a region like this. Okay. And uh, uh, when we define actually entanglement wedge, uh, we consider uh, some kind of time development of this region. But for the purpose of this uh, discussion today, I will just restrict that to this Cauchy slice. So, but anyway, so entanglement wedge reconstruction said that. Uh, uh, Quantum gravity operator localized in the shaded region can be represented by operator on the subregion A. So subregion A knows everything that happens. So some, everything about uh, some local excitation of the region between A and its Ryu Takayanagi surface. But it does, A doesn't have access to uh, the complement of the region. Okay, so that's a sort of a, 
uh, uh, entanglement with reconstruction statement. So these are the two facts uh, I'm going to use. So if we, we use these two facts, then we can derive the absence of global symmetry in quantum gravity. So idea goes as follows. So suppose you have a low energy gravitational theory in Einstein space, and suppose this theory happened to have global symmetry. So for example, you can write down some low energy effective action, and the low energy effective action may, be, uh, uh, may have some global symmetry in it. So the question is that, the, that does that global symmetry upgrade to the full symmetry of uh, uh, quantum gravity? Okay, so that's a question. Okay, uh, there's one important step uh, that we took quite a bit of pages uh, in your paper to show, which is that uh, if you have global symmetry, if you had such global symmetry, uh, we are going to prove that such things does not exist. But if you had it, if there is there were such thing, then that must become symmetry of conformity. Okay, so that's uh, that statement that is sort sort of obvious, but it requires uh, some careful. Uh, discussion to establish it, but we did establish it. But suppose that is the case, then since this is a symmetry of both uh, 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 gravity theory and conformal theory, there must be some bulk local operator that transforms faithfully into other local operator at the same point. That's what global symmetry does uh, in gravity theory. That, so there, there must be such an operator. But we can show that uh, this assumption contradicts with these two facts. So here is, a, uh, here is a way to see it. So suppose you have uh, uh, such symmetries or the intersymmetry of the conformal field theory as well. So if there is a unitary operator to realize this symmetry, so for any element small g of this capital G, there is a unitary operator acting on conformal field theory. Then suppose you divide the boundary uh, a Cauchy slice into segment like R1, R2 to R8. Then this unitary operator can also be decomposed into product of unitary operator like that. But each unitary operator is defined only on these subregions. So the entanglement wedge uh, is, for each, of, each one of them, is represented by this shaded region. Okay. Now, suppose you, have, you put some charged operator in the middle of one the space. Then none of these shaded region uh, uh, covers this location. So that means that uh, this operator should commute with X. But that contradicts with uh, the assumption that this operator should transform faithfully uh, into another operator under this unitary generator that realizes symmetry. So that's a contradiction. So we have, we have been able to show that the uh, uh, existence of such global symmetry is in contradiction with uh, this uh, very established uh, statement. Okay, so that was uh, 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 the, our derivation. Okay, so I would like to also tell you uh, what we did for the completeness of gauge charge. So since global symmetry in anti-ADS space, uh, gra anti -ADS gravity does not exist. So the only symmetry you can have is gauge symmetry. Okay, so, so we would like to show the completeness hypothesis of the gauge symmetry, which is a statement that if you have a gauge group G, then uh, well, you, there are a variety of different uh, uh, irreducible representation of G. So for example, if you have SU2 symmetry, then uh, uh, there are irreducible representation parameterized by uh, spin, which is integer or half of odd numbers. Uh, the statement is that all of these uh, representations are realized in the Hilbert space. Okay? So this was, uh, I think, most uh, precisely formulated by Joe Polchinski. Now, uh, in, order, in order to prove that, uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a uh, uh, two step. First is to show that uh, suppose uh, you have a, a gauge symmetry G in the bar. There is, a, uh, there is also a corresponding symmetry on the boundary conformal history. Uh, we just want, we wanted to make sure that these two groups are exactly the same group that uh, they, are, they are identical. Namely, if you have a representation that faithfully transforming conformal field theory side, that should also be the same, same for the gravity side. So for example, you, you don't want to be in a situation where on the gravity side, you have SO3 symmetry, whereas in conformal field theory, you have SU2 symmetry. You want to make sure that if you have SU2 symmetry in conformal field theory, in gravity side, 
you can have non-trivial state which transforms under SU2 as well as SO3, okay? Uh, so, uh, and once we establish that, it's sort of, uh, it's basically simple mathematical uh, 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 procedure to prove that the all finite dimensional irreducible representation can be generated. So, so we are, I'm going to show the logic for this. Okay, so the first step is uh, 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 require, uh, require the following uh, thing that you want to show that uh, uh, if you have symmetry in uh, holographic conformal field theory, then you can always construct some bulk operator that transforms faithfully uh, under this representation. And in our paper, we were able to construct uh, such a bulk operator using Wilson line uh, threading through uh, uh, ADS wormhole. So if you have ADS wormhole, you can consider a uh, Wilson line operator starting from one boundary to the other for any representation. And uh, uh, if you have uh, some group in holographic, uh, a symmetry group in holographic conformal view theory, you can show that uh, this, uh, you, can, you can find uh, Wilson line operator which transforms faithfully under this uh, 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 group. So that established that there is actually a bulk operator uh, which transforms non trivially under this symmetry, uh, phase free under this uh, 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 group. So therefore, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bulk gauge group is also phase free realized. So this is, uh, this is one statement. And once you have that statement, then completeness hypothesis follows uh, straightforwardly uh, from the following mathematical theorem. So this is the mathematical theorem that you can establish. So let me just state it. So suppose you have you pick any faithful finite dimensional representation of the group G, okay? So in this case, in, in the case of uh, ADS-CFT, we do have it because we have established that if you have a global symmetry G, then uh, you can have a, a bulk operator which transforms faithfully under uh, this. Uh, group G. So you do have at least one finite dimensional representation, which is phase. So what we want to show that uh, a Hilbert space contains uh, all faithful representations, all irreducible, or it doesn't have to be even faithful, all irreducible representations. Okay, but uh, we can actually establish it using the following argument. So there you can actually prove some mathematical lemma that shows that if there is any faithful representation, then let's consider a uh, direct sum of this representation and raise some even power of this. Then you can show that if you decompose it into irreducible representation, it, they generate uh, all finite dimensional irreducible representations in this way, okay? So, so this is, uh, you can prove this by calculating, say, for example, character of this representation and use some orthogonality of the character to calculate how many representation appear in this, in this decomposition. And you can prove this. Uh, so it's a sort of a, a one page proof uh, of this. There is a one page proof of this statement, which is in the appendix of our earlier paper. Okay. So therefore, uh, if you can consider such operator, then uh, you can generate all the finite dimensional representation. Now you can ask, well, this is true uh, in terms of uh, group theory. But uh, for example, it, can, it may happen that uh, some operator that uh, you, 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 you uh, some operator product you calculate may happen to vanish, for example. And uh, in that case, some of the uh, uh, finite dimensional reducible representation that could have been generated may not appear in this presentation. But in fact, we can prove that uh, something like that will not happen. So in fact, we can use, uh, so this is actually a statement about uh, a quantum field theory, and rho is a local operator in this quantum field theory. So in this case, you can actually use the uh, really Schrader theorem. So this is a statement in algebraic uh, quantum field theory, where uh, which, which has to do with uh, non-triviality of some operator constructed in this way. And you can prove that uh, if you consider such operator and if you act on the vacuum state and project on, onto any finite dimensional reducible representation, that state is no, has non-zero norm. So that's followed from the rich Schrader theorem. So therefore, uh, in, indeed, uh, all finite dimensional representations are, are realized in this way. Okay. So so that was uh, that was a two that uh, that was a two statement 
a sort of brief review of the two statements I mentioned. So namely that the absence of global symmetry and completeness of gauge charges. So, so this is what we did uh, three years ago. So now I'd like to move on to, to show you the, a new derivation of this completeness and also tell you, uh, this, this method tell you more detailed structure of charge distribution. So, so this is what I'd like to tell you next. So, so I have given you the proof of the completeness of gauge charges in quantum gravity, but this does not yet tell you how this charge appears. We, this just tells you that these charges appear. So for example, this shows that uh, the charges can be generated, but this is one way to generate charges and there can be other ways. So how do you know that how many representations are realized in this way, etc. So I will tell you more uh, 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 detailed knowledge about uh, uh, charge distribution. So this is based on uh, uh, our new paper uh, we posted a couple of weeks ago. So this derivation uh, involves a couple of steps. The first step is that suppose you have holographic conformal field theory. So this is, uh, so let's take the trace, uh, this con let's calculate what you may call twisted partition function. So twisted partition function is calculated by trace over the Hilbert space of this conformal field theory. E to the beta H, H is the Hamiltonian of the conformal field theory, B beta is an inverse temperature. But in it, suppose we insert some group element G. Well, more precisely, so, so I'm abusing a notation a little bit. So this is meant to be unitary operator. So you, you could have written this as U of G. So you, a unitary operator representing this group G on the Hilbert space of the conformal field theory. Then in fact, uh, uh, for finite uh, group symmetry, you can prove that uh, for high, te high temperature, uh, this is non-zero only for G equal identity. Okay, so this, is, this delta function of G is that it gives you one. So this is a finite group. So this gives you one when group is identity, group element is identity and is zero otherwise. Okay, so basically we, we can show that uh, this vanishes unless G is trivial. And when G is trivial, of course, this is proportional to the untwisted partial function. So this is a statement. And we, we claim that this, true, this is true for high, high temperature limit, okay? So we're gonna prove this for holographic conformal field theory. In fact, it seems like this is more general, this statement is more general than holographic conformal field theory, but we prove this by using holographic holography of conformal field theory. So, uh, so let me uh, first uh, derive this statement, okay? So uh, suppose you, we take high temperature limit of this calculation. Well, above the Hawking page transition, uh, we can calculate this trace because Euclidean, this is Euclidean calculation. So uh, this, this trace is, this partial function should be dominated by Euclidean black hole. So in the bulk, you have a Euclidean black hole. So you have a boundary uh, Euclidean time going around it. And at some point in Euclidean time, you insert this group, group area. So that's the calculation. But the important point is that uh, in this Euclidean gravity, this uh, uh, imaginary time direction, which is periodic because of this trace, uh, is contractible to a point because the uh, black hole has a horizon. And in Euclidean, uh, after analytic continuation, horizon becomes a point. And that's where the boundary uh, time cycle, Euclid uh, Euclidean time cycle can shrink to a point. So above Hawking page transition, it becomes like that. But then using this presentation, we can prove that this vanishes un unless uh, G is trivial. So here is one way to prove it. Suppose I insert a Wilson line operator in some representation R, alpha. So it can be any representation. Now, when uh, two endpoints are on the same side of this uh, 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 unitary operator, and when I and J are close to each other, it's clear that it's proportional to the uh, Kronecker delta, where I and J is a representation index of, uh, of this group G. So Wilson line endpoint carries a representation. So suppose it is in the representation alpha, then there are a certain number of state in the uh, representation space. And then when uh, uh, endpoint are closed, you get Kronecker delta. And then the Wilson line shrink to a point and then the rest is like that. But here we are considering finite group. So in finite groups, there is no curvature. Of course, it's a finite. So uh, you cannot, there is no way to have uh, curvature. So it's locally topological. So that means that we can move this endpoint all the way over here 
and ended up end up this configuration space. And since there is no curvature, we can do this without costing anything. So suppose we do this. Now, this, this 10 points are sandwiching this uh, unitary operator. Now, that, suppose I move this all to the other side, then you'll be commuting this end point with this unitary operator. So then this uh, expectation value is multiplied by this representation matrix. So D alpha of G is a representation matrix of this group G in the representation alpha, okay? But this one again is Kronecker delta, so we can calculate it this way. So we, in this way, we can prove the identity that uh, this is equal to this. So this is what I wrote. So Kronecker delta minus representation matrix times the twisted trace is going to be zero for any representation, okay? So, but if uh, we can, well, well, there are two possibilities. Either this is zero or this is zero, okay? So suppose this is not zero. So suppose this twisted trace is not equal to zero, then that means that this has to be equal to zero. But it's a simple mathematical fact that uh, if the representation matrix is always Kronecker delta for any representation, then that means that group element must be identical. That's what uh, representation being faithful means, right? So that means that uh, this is zero only when G is identity, and otherwise this has to bunch. So this is equivalent to the statement that uh, this twisted uh, 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 passion function vanishes under, unless group element is trivial. Okay, so this we proved. So the next step is pure mathematics. So this is something you learn in undergraduate uh, group theory course, right? So, so if you have uh, a, 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 a finite group, and if you have uh, this uh, delta function in the space of finite group, then you can expand this. Uh, so so this, uh, this in terms of this class function, which is uh, in this case, a character. So character, so one of the things uh, you learn in group theory is that character is form the complete orthogonal basis in the space of class function. Uh, a function of a conjugate a conjugacy class of group. And uh, in the case of the delta function, the coefficient is given by the ratio of dimensional representation divided by dimension of the group. So that means that uh, since this is proportional to this uh, Kronecker delta for high temperature, so that means that this is equal to this times the uh, passion function. So this tells you how actually this passion, uh, twisted passion function can be decomposed into characters. And this is the same as showing that how the Hilbert space is decomposed into representation of the, the group. Namely, this shows that each representation alpha occupies a dimension alpha square divided by a dimension of a group of all state. So here, actually, you have dimension alpha in the uh, uh, numerator. You have, here, you have dimension alpha square because each, each representation contains a dimension alpha state, right? So, so therefore, if you ask, uh, suppose I pick some uh, random high energy state, what's the probability of finding that state to be in a particular representation alpha? It is given by uh, 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 this ratio. But again, this is a simple group theory factor that if you consider this and if you sum over R or alpha, it is one. So therefore, this gives you the probability of uh, finding that particular high energy state to be in this representation. Okay? So this is actually a stronger statement than the completeness hypothesis, because this shows that not only all representation appears, but it also tells you which fraction of high energy state is uh, uh, in, uh, in this representation alpha. So it gives you more refined knowledge. So you, you see that this derivation does not tell, use much of knowledge of uh, quantum gravity. All I use is the fact that the, this boundary uh, uh, Euclidean time direction is contractible. So this seems to be a rather general statement. So I only use the existence of holographic dual where summer circle contract high temperature. So this in inspires us to make some kind of conjecture where any quantum field theory with a finite group global symmetry uh, or any compact spatial manifold, this statement holds at sufficiently high temperature. So that seems to be a reasonable extension of what we just found. 
So in fact, I can present some evidence for it. The first evidence is that uh, this is actually true in any conformal field theory in the case of a two-dimensional conformal field theory. So in the case, context of ADS3, CFT2, uh, you can actually prove this for any finite group. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we, can, we can go stronger. We can also prove this for any compact group too. And uh, so this makes use of some knowledge of conformal field theory from 80s. Uh, so there was a work by Drone Gepner uh, who shows uh, uh, that uh, you can realize this affine group. Well, first of all, I would like to say that if you have continuous symmetry in two dimensional conformal field theory, you can, it's always upgraded to uh, a Katsumudi symmetry, the affine group symmetry. So, so you have this affine uh, D algebra. So you have affine D algebra generators. And then uh, Drone Gepner showed that, in fact, it is represented in terms of uh, free boson and paraferments. And you can use this representation to calculate this quantity. And you can, you can actually derive this statement in high temperature limit. So in conformal field theory uh, in two dimension, uh, this seems to be indeed much uh, general statement. Uh, it'd be nice to understand how things work in higher dimensions. And uh, 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 we are thinking about this a little bit. Uh, so, but there is actually also a nice heuristic argument of why, why this is true. So remember that uh, when we derived uh, uh, completeness hypothesis, prove, prove the completeness hypothesis, we consider this type of uh, presentation. I for, uh, I'm sorry, there is a typo. This should be 2n. And then we decomposed it into, uh, uh, we show that this contains all the finite dimensional representation. But we can actually make a stronger statement that we can actually see how this uh, representation can be decomposed, this particular construction can be decomposed into irreducible representation. We can calculate the branching ratio. And in particular, if you take the limit, you reproduce this dimension of the representation, okay? So, so again, with this simple calculation, you reproduce this statement. So, so this seems to be rather gen gen general fact. And in fact, there are more. So for example, there are other examples. So, so it was known like already uh, more than 20 years ago, this is a work by Ashok Sen, that he calculated twisted index for extremal black hole for n equal four supersymmetry, I think in four dimension with GM charge. And he proved something like that in this context. And this is also known more recently by the work of Kapek, Mahajan, Stanford, that this is also true in two dimensional Jack U title bond gravity coupled to BF uh, gauge theory. So this seems to be a rather general statement. Here we prove this for rather generally for any uh, holographic conformal field theory. And these are like specific cases. In this case, it's actually continuous group. So it seems to be, uh, it suggests that in fact, uh, this statement can be generalized in certain cases to continuous group too. So anyway, so this is a conclu conclusion of my talk. So we use the Euclidean quantum gravity to derive the distribution of representation of a finite group gauge symmetry at high temperature, and this is a formula. So this shows you that uh, uh, what fraction of high energy state uh, is in particular representation alpha, which gives the refinement of the completeness of gauge charges. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Hiroshi, for this interesting and clear talk. Let's see if there are questions here in the audience. Several questions. Hello, my name is uh, Emmanuel Floratos. I would like you to ask you a nice question. When you construct a supergravity theory on, uh, on ADS, ADS uh, of any dimension, you impose that uh, you respect the isometry group of the space time. In this can you case, come closer to the microphone? It's a little bit hot here. I'm sorry. So uh, my question is the following. Uh, when you construct the supergravity theory on ABS space-time, you must impose that this uh, 
uh, uh, theory, all the fields of this theory should uh, uh, transform according to representations of the um, isometry group of the space-time, okay, which is the ADS are the known uh, isometry groups. Why these isometry groups are not good groups to cl be classified as continuous symmetries of the supergravity? Well, the, the isometry group is a gauge, uh, so, 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 sort of a non-normalizable part of the gauge symmetry, right? I'm sorry, you said that... Uh, no, so, uh, which part of the statement are you referring to? Are you talking global, about the absence of global symmetry? Global symmetry, this is what you said. So, so I talked about absence of global symmetry. The isometry is not global symmetry. It's actually gauge symmetry because it's part of the reparameterization symmetry. You see that uh, you, in ADS CFT correspondence, global symmetry of the conformal theory is a gauge symmetry in the bulk, but non-normalizable part of the gauge symmetry becomes global symmetry of the conformal theory. Conformal theory has a conformal transformation symmetry, which is an isometry of one theta space. And so in that, this, this is a special case of what I just stated, namely that isometry is a subgroup of diffeomorphism of anti-theta space, which is uh, uh, the gauge this symmetry. Is, why this is bad? It is a group, continuous group. It's a oh, continuous it's a group. Okay. I, I'm not sure which, which part of my talk are you referring to. It is. It's a continuous symmetry, so it has a continuous symmetry, okay? So which part of the, uh, uh, my talk are you questioning? I talked okay. about various different things about symmetries. I wanted to make sure which part of your, my talk are you referring to? To the first part, to the first theorem. Okay. Absence, absence of, of global symmetry. So absence of global symmetry applies both to discrete symmetry and continuous symmetry. But okay. it's, it does not, it does not uh, the, apply the to... Time is not a global symmetry of the quantum gravity. Why it is not? This is the question. Uh, so, okay, so, so isometry of an space is not global symmetry. It's a gauge symmetry. You mean inter you, you It's a global uh, symmetry of the boundary conformal field. Internal symmetry, not space-time symmetry. Because you did not say that global symmetry does not refer to space-time symmetry. Well, the, 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 the conformal symmetry of the boundary sigma model, let's put it like that. You mean, you, you mean the um, internal cannot have global internal symmetry, not space time continuous symmetry. Okay. So, so can, can you actually state the question clearly? Well, yeah. state the time, so I don't know if it's not clear enough. Could you, could you state the question? Because otherwise, I cannot answer the question. Could you state the question? The question is that if the isometry, it's a continuous group of the, the center space time, is not a global symmetry of the supergravity which lives on the center space time. I'm sorry, it's very hard to hear. Are you asking whether isometry of the center space is a global symmetry or not? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, so the answer is no. Isometry of line theta space is not global symmetry of uh, uh, gravity theory. It is a global symmetry of conformal theory. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello. I, I would like to ask about your first, first uh, uh, generalization of the Noether uh, um, uh, theorem, yes. I mean, if, uh, yes, yeah, so if one consider the uh, original uh, article of Young and Mills, so it says that, you know, the group should work, the symmetry group should work in different places independently if these places are, let's say, not connected. Uh, um, so the, the local symmetry, it's, it sounds that what you are saying, is it similar to that statement of Young Mills, basic statement or not? So in Young Mills, are you referring to gauge symmetry? Yes, I mean, somehow, what is the idea what, of Young Mills was? It says, okay, 
the symmetry is not uh, so he, the statement of uh, initial statement of the young Mills, as I remember, it was that um, there is a uh, um, places in the universe which are not connected uh, by light signals, and therefore the symmetry should be local in every patch of the uh, of the space time. So it it sounds that what you say generalization it sounds to me like uh, this idea. Is it different? That's it what my different. question. Yeah, it is different. So so I think you are talking about gauge symmetry, and here the statement is about global symmetry. So uh, the gauge symmetry actually does not act non-trivially on the Hilbert space, physical Hilbert space. That's sort of one of the features of gauge symmetry. So that if you have global symmetry, there is a non-trivial unitary operator. And so, so here I'm talking about property of this unitary operator. And, uh, but this is sort of reflection. This type of property, the net theorem, is a reflection of the fact that degrees of freedom of quantum field theory is local. So, so therefore, this unitary operator also acts locally on this. Uh, uh, so this is similar in spirit of the philosophy you are expressing, but applied to different kinds of symmetry. So this is not a statement about gauge symmetry. This is about global symmetry. And you can actually see this rather easily if you use uh, the ordinary Neta theorem for continuum symmetry. But non-trivial fact is that this also works for uh, discrete symmetry too. Okay, thank you very much. I understood, okay. yeah. All right, I don't see any more uh, immediate questions here in the audience. So thank you again, Hiroshi, for this. Okay, nice thank you very much for the kind invitation. Right, we come uh, to the final talk in this session, the final talk in this workshop by Stephen Giddens, Black Holes and Clues for Quantum Gravity. Okay. Thank you. Let me get my screen share going here. One moment. Okay, so I hope everyone can see that okay. Let me finish getting set up. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much to the uh, organizers for the uh, invitation to talk at this uh, stimulating and diverse meeting. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, greetings from Aspen. I've chosen my background appropriately. <clears throat> uh, so the subject of today is uh, black holes and other clues for quantum gravity, a slight change in the title. So I've long believed uh, that the problem of black hole information really is a key problem in quantum gravity, much as understanding the atom played a key role in the development of quantum mechanics. That was one of the true key problems there. If that's the case, then we would like to use this problem as a guide to the new principles of quantum gravity, whatever they are. Even more interestingly, uh, we might uh, use black holes as a uh, way of finding possible observational signatures of quantum gravity. And of course, that would be even more interesting. So today I'll be updating some perspectives on this set of questions. And in fact, there are uh, various perspectives uh, on the problem of quantum gravity uh, as, and on specifically the problem of uh, black holes and information, as many of you know, uh, and there are various proposed resolutions uh, specifically to the problem of uh, black hole information. Recently, there's been a lot of focus on entropy calculations uh, in the past couple of years, uh, but I want to remind you that entropies are just one diagnostic of what is going on. And so uh, part of what I'll do today is take a step sort of backwards uh, and uh, think about things that in some sense a more basic level and suggest a way of organizing our understanding of the problem uh, which connects an information theoretic perspective uh, but also focuses on some of the basic questions that may be important. 
And in fact, what I'm gonna start with is uh, what I'll call black hole theorem. I'll put that in quotes. Uh, one of the reasons I put this in quotes is because it should be viewed in a spirit somewhat similar to the coleman mandula theorem. Or of course, the interesting thing about the coleman mandula theorem was where was the loophole? And that was where supersymmetry came in. And so here as well, I think the interesting part is where the loophole lies and uh, that probably uh, will when we figure it out, tell us important new things about quantum gravity. So here's a uh, version one of the black hole theorem. Uh, if a black hole is a subsystem, if distinct black hole states have identical exterior evolution, and if a black hole disappears at the end of its evolution, then this violates quantum mechanics. It contradicts the unitary evolution uh, part of quantum mechanics. Now, of course, I could state the same set of, uh, the same list of things uh, for other uh, su subsystems of systems, uh, but uh, we're going to focus on the black hole case. And here uh, I want to start by clarifying uh, what I mean by these various assumptions that I've outlined. So first, a what do we mean by saying a black hole is a subsystem? Well, colloquially, in a lot of the literature, uh, it's been stated that uh, there is a, uh, an inner product, or sorry, not an inner product, a, a tensor product between the black hole Hilbert space and the Hilbert space corresponding to, the, say, the rest of the universe, the environment. Now, in quantum field theory, uh, that is not quite the right way of doing things, or at least it's a little bit problematic typically to factorize the Hilbert space like that. <clears throat> so let's be a little more careful. And here I've drawn uh, the uh, space-time diagram, first Penrose diagram or Eddington-Finkelstein diagram corresponding to a black hole geometry. I'll actually use the Eddington-Finkelstein diagrams more. And we can think about a slice through uh, one of those geometries here corresponding slices. And the state on the slice has uh, separate labels, separate attributes for the uh, black hole part inside and for the environment part outside. So you can write that in this form. So that's one way of saying how you think about subsystems in local quantum field theory. A sort of more precise way of getting at it is to think about operator subalgebras. And you have a statement that you have, again, in local quantum field theory, operator subalgebras that commute uh, at space-like separation. So separate operator subalgebras corresponding to, say, the interior part and the exterior part of the black hole. Uh, there's another way of getting closer to this factorization involving the split vacuum, but I won't say uh, much about that today. So uh, that's the first uh, sort of basic assumption. A black hole is a subsystem. And I think this is in fact an important point in general in quantum gravity, how you think about subsystems. We'll come back to this. Let me remind you that in local quantum field theory and with other quantum systems, subsystem structure is hardwired at the beginning. Uh, it, it's one of the things you start with. And I think that's one of the questions in quantum gravity, what plays the analogous role. Okay, next, distinct black hole states have identical exterior evolution. So let's consider evolution on a set of slices uh, from one to another later in time, like I've described. And the basic statement is we can have one or another state inside the black hole and the same state outside the black hole. And if we follow the evolution, uh, the different interior states don't affect the future, uh, different ex uh, the future exterior states because uh, the, say, excitations here stay within the light cone. And here I've drawn the light rays inside the black hole. They go into R equals zero. So that's what I mean by this statement. And there's a very concrete realization of this. You can write down the evolution operator from local quantum field theory that describes Hawking evolution. And uh, we've you know, even made that more concrete in some recent papers, the full d-dimensional case we're uh, also uh, working on in progress. Uh, with a Santa Barbara student, Julie Perkins. And uh, so, so this is the basic picture and there are different ways of characterizing uh, this or, or describing this statement. Uh, one is you can think about trying to construct a density matrix where you trace over the black hole degrees of freedom. And so that should be independent of the initial state uh, in the black hole interior. 
I, although formulating a density matrix like this is a little bit cutoff dependent and a little bit problematic. Another way of stating it is if you take any observable outside the black hole, uh, say here, and look at its expectation value in the state uh, on the slice, uh, that that's independent of what you started with, uh, again, in the black hole interior for, for all such observables. So in local quantum field theory, this is how you put in locality. Now, of course, we're ignoring gravitational back reaction. And uh, one can, well, in general, that's an issue, which I'll come back to, but one can do one step better with this. And for, for example, semi-classically correct this geometry to include the leading order effect of the Hawking radiation, the shrinkage of the black hole, as we did uh, back with the old uh, so-called CGHS model. Finally, there's this statement that the black hole disappears at the end of evolution. So whatever this evolution law is, uh, the, uh, that statement corresponds to uh, the statement that you end up with uh, an exterior state that again, doesn't depend on the uh, internal excitations. And then uh, maybe the vacuum or maybe some fiducial state uh, corresponding to the black hole part of the uh, Hilbert space or black hole part of the um, state. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, if the black hole is gone, then this is just one unique thing, say the vacuum. And uh, again, the state of the environment doesn't depend on the internal states of the black hole. And that's where you see the theorem, uh, you know, essentially proved it's trivial. Uh, if this is what happens, then you have many to one evolution and that evolution is uh, manifestly non-unitary. It's going to violate uh, quantum mechanics. There are different ways of diagnosing that. You can diagnose that using entropies. You can, for example, entangle the internal states of the black hole with some ex external degrees of freedom or an auxiliary system. In fact, that's what happens when you uh, basically build up the state uh, via Hawking emission. Uh, and so this has a non-zero entanglement entropy, and, but if this happens, then that suddenly jumps down, or that in the end uh, goes down to zero, and you know, that's one way of diagnosing it. There, there are different ways of using the entropy to diagnose this. So that's what I mean by this uh, set of statements. And uh, so once again, we need to find a way out uh, if we, for example, want to save quantum mechanics. And so to evade this uh, chain of reasoning, we have to violate one or more of the assumptions. And like I said, with Coleman Mandula, the interesting part may be where the loophole lies. So there are various popular proposed outs and a good task question uh, for whatever your favorite one is, is how does your proposal differ from the local quantum field theory story? Uh, and how does it, uh, what postulates uh, that I've talked about, uh, does it alter? And of course, once again, we have an increasingly detailed story about how uh, local quantum field theory uh, governs the evolution of the Hawking story. So let's go through quickly some examples. So the first one is microscopic remnants. Uh, that's a longstanding idea um, that there's something left behind, say, of Planck size that contains all the information from the initial black hole. Of course, that violates assumption three, disappearance, and it introduces other problems, basically infinite production of these things. And there's some discussion, for example, in these refer references. Another uh, idea is that of massive remnants that at some point the black hole transitions into a new kind of object, maybe more of a star-like object. Let's just call it a massive remnant while the black hole is still big. And there are various realizations of this general class of uh, uh, scenarios. You know, the fuzzballs, firewalls, gravistars, Planck stars, and so on. And of course, that's going to modify both the subsystem story and the evolution story in a significant way. There's been a lot of discussion of ER equals EPR, which suggests a different subsystem identification, but there's a question, at least in my mind, how systematically that works. And there are various other scenarios, uh, for example, um, Tufts or you know, others that people have talked about, uh, which I'll leave as an exercise for the listener to classify. But one that has been recently quite popular, which I will say a little bit more about, is that of replica wormholes. Uh, so with the replica wormhole story, we had two curves that we knew about uh, for a long time. The growing entanglement entropy between the outgoing Hawking radiation and the black hole states uh, inside the black hole, 
And of course, the falling uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And so we have known that we should follow a curve like this, where we stay on the lower of the two, it's sometimes called the page curve. And basically the replica wormhole story, and I've only been able to uh, write a few of the relevant people who've worked on it, there are a lot of others. Uh, basically that gives a, a rule or a prescription uh, for how you follow this, um, the lower of the two curves uh, that involves what looks like different saddle points in uh, certain Euclidean geometries. But there's a question, and that is how do we relate this story to the standard quantum mechanical language of states and amplitudes? Or you know, does it in fact represent a modification of the basic quantum mechanical rules, uh, you know, not taking traces of products of density matrices, but doing something else? And there's some discussion of that in this paper. The closest thing to an explanation of this that connects to amplitudes uh, is the story involving baby universes and their emission, uh, which has been uh, discussed, for example, by Maroff and Maxfield and uh, various others. And so a basic picture you might have in mind is, for example, uh, you might have the black hole interior and somehow a piece of that branches off and becomes a new baby universe uh, that sort of goes out into what we call the void. <clears throat> and uh, so does that explain what's going on? Well, first of all, it seems like a significant modification of subsystem structure. It looks like information could go off into the baby universe state. But at least in an approximation, that's not quite how to think about it. Um, there's a general approach, again, true in an approximation, basically in the free baby universe approximation. It goes back to work uh, that Coleman and myself and Strominger did uh, decades ago. And one can summarize, in fact, this baby universe emission in terms of a correction to the Hamiltonian, which involves uh, annihilation and creation oper operators for the baby universes times an operator, which represents their effect on, on our space time. And uh, the interesting thing is, if that's the form of the Hamiltonian, uh, then you can diagonalize this uh, term involving the baby universes and work in what we called an alpha eigenstate or an alpha vacuum. And once you've done that, then you've got a correction to the Hamiltonian, which just involves some operator and some new coupling constant. So there's a distribution for coupling constants, uh, but then we're back to a theory uh, where you don't really see any other effect of the baby universe. So if the operators uh, that the baby universes connect to are localized inside a black hole, it's hard to see how that helps. Uh, basically, you're back to the assumptions uh, in the uh, black hole theorem, just with some distribution of coupling constants. Uh, the one possibility here that uh, may lead to uh, a new insight on the problem is maybe these operators are non-local on scales of order of the black hole horizon or bigger, and that would violate assumption two. Uh, that would possibly give a way for outside evolution to to depend on the black hole state uh, and give some sort of non-local inter interactions uh, of that kind. And I'll return to that in a bit. Uh, you know, or maybe there's some other interpretation of the story that I'm missing. Uh, it's an interesting question what it is, how to sort of frame things in this kind of language. But let's return to a more uh, general discussion and uh, go back to our assumptions and ask, you know, how much new structure uh, do we really need to introduce to solve the problem? Uh, are there less drastic modifications of say the local quantum field theory story that get us there? And so I'll start with the question of a black hole being a subsystem. In fact, in quantum gravity, I think a very important question, as I said, is what is a subsystem? Uh, and that might be one of the important basic concepts which we need to understand in quantum gravity. So first for finite or locally finite systems like a lattice system, uh, we represent the structure of subsystems in terms of a uh, product of Hilbert space factors. Uh, and one of the basic properties is say a measurement in this part of the Hilbert space is independent of the state in this part of the Hilbert space. In local quantum field theory, that doesn't work quite as well. And so uh, more typically one works in terms of uh, basically composing uh, local subalgebras of the algebra of observables. That's a 
classic story of algebraic quantum field theory described for example, example in Hogg's book. Uh, but a simple version of how that works is the following. So let's think about a neighborhood uh, here in space and we can construct a state by acting on the vacuum with say uh, the exponential of a source J, which has compact support uh, times scalar field, for example, uh, acting on the vacuum. And if this does have compact support and I make a measurement out here at X outside the neighborhood, then uh, that observation or measurement of the field phi is independent of whatever I did in the neighborhood with that compact support source. So uh, <clears throat> this is something that Hawking evolution respects uh, and it constrains the information escape uh, going back to that story. And that's how uh, locality is encoded in uh, the story of local quantum field theory. <clears throat> but in gravity, the problem is uh, say the scalar field operator is not gauge invariant and the state I've described is not gauge invariant. One way of seeing that is they don't commute with the constraints or that operators like this, or the state is not annihilated by the constraints. And uh, at least in an effective theory, which is basically a quantum version of GR, we don't know what the deeper theory is, of course. Uh, these constraints are uh, what you would set to zero to get the Einstein's equations with zero mu components. This is one you know, sort of very simple way of describing it. Physically, what's going on is a particle is inseparable from its gravitational field, which of course will typically extend off to infinity. So how do we uh, write down sensible states and operators? Well, you have to solve the constraints and construct what is called the gravitational dressing. And we can do that perturbatively by working about some background and looking at a perturbation of the metric. Here, kappa is basically the square root of Newton's constant. Uh, and then in terms of this operator, we can promote a state like this, which was a localized quantum field theory state to a state within quantum gravity, which involves metric perturbation. And the question is what say does this operator look like? And to leading order in kappa, you can figure that out. Uh, it involves uh, say, if you're thinking about the state an exponential of an integral of a certain functional of H metric perturbation times the stress tensor uh, acting on the original state we had. Or if you want to find operators that commute with the constraints, uh, similar, similarly, you conjugate with a, an expression like what we just described. So uh, this is a story which we've developed uh, in uh, work with uh, Donnelly and Kinsella and ADS. Uh, there's also been a recent reworking of some of this in a slightly different language in this paper here. Uh, and the basic picture is that whatever our uh, state was where we created excitations in this neighborhood, you have to also have gravitational dressing going off to infinity uh, to satisfy the constraints. But now when you think about those operators, for example, the operators that are dressed, they're not going to commute at space-like separations. The uh, gravitational dressing uh, leads to an obstacle to them commuting. And uh, likewise, uh, for example, if we have an operator that is creating an excitation in a neighborhood, well, we can go outside that neighborhood and say measure the gravitational field and get something that depends on the fact that we've created this non-trivial state. We don't get the vacuum value for that. So there's a question of in what sense does information localize in gravity? What is a subsystem in gravity? And so once again, that looks like a key structural question for quantum gravity, how to think about this correctly. So there are some uh, basic results on that, uh, which I'll outline. We don't have a complete story, but first of all, you can perturbatively choose the dressing. I should have stated when we wrote down that func functional V uh, of H, there were different choices that were allowed, basically uh, corresponding to different ways you could dress that state. And you can always choose a perturbative dressing uh, such that, for example, if you look at endpoint functions of the metric perturbation outside the neighborhood, uh, those only depend on the Poincaré charges of the, the stuff inside the neighborhood. Uh, so that's something that was described in uh, these two references. So that suggests, for example, a limited role for soft hair. If we're just measuring, say, endpoint functions of the metric asymptotically, well, they only depend on the total Poincaré charges. 
But uh, on the other hand, there are observables which can see a non-trivial state in the neighborhood from afar. And that comes from the fact that the translation generators in gravity can be written as uh, boundary terms, basically say in the Hamiltonian case, the ADM uh, energy or ADM momenta more generally, uh, plus the, uh, an integral of the constraints. And so if we set the constraints to zero, then we say that the uh, translation generators are just represented in terms of surface terms. So Meroff, in fact, used this kind of reasoning to give a proposed explanation for holography, what I think is the best sort of candidate for how to construct the holographic map, uh, that you can relate, say, uh, an excitation in this neighborhood or an operator in this neighborhood through propagation to an operator on the boundary. And then you can relate an operator on the boundary at this future time uh, to an operator on the boundary back at the same time uh, by acting with these boundary operators, say the boundary Hamiltonian uh, to translate back. And that's again, supposed to live just in the boundary algebra. In fact, there's a simpler version of his story, never mind this complicated story, if uh, the translation generators all live at the boundary, just take this state and translate it out to infinity using one of the translation operators. And that was an argument that uh, we gave in this paper with Donnelly and then observe it. So for example, uh, if we take one of our states that corresponds to an excitation with its gravitational field, we act with the translation operator uh, to translate it out to infinity and we can you know, observe it with some operator out at infinity and get a non-zero result. Uh, so we get specifically something that depends on the non-trivial properties of the state. Uh, so that suggests information is delocalized uh, in quantum gravity. Some notes on this though. Uh, first, we need to have a solution of the constraints for this to work. Uh, and so that's the non-trivial uh, statement. And in fact, you need apparently a non-perturbative solution for this to work uh, in general. And there's some discussion in these references. Uh, one way of seeing that is think about two states that correspond to different things inside a black hole. And if you're going to apply this argument where you in effect translate out to infinity, uh, it's clear you're going to need a non-perturbative construction of the dressing and, and the uh, state and so on to be able to relate to something out at infinity. Also, never mind black holes, even if we just have a region, uh, say, um, in a weak gravitational field, you still need to translate it by basically an infinite distance or very large distance. And so that uh, suggests that you need sort of non-perturbative information in kappa. There has been some suggestion that uh, this whole story extends to perturbative availability of information at infinity. But if you look carefully, you see that the things they're talking about are exponentially small. So that's not clear that we can truly uh, gain access to information at infinity this way. But in any case, uh, there's a story here to understand more completely. And there's a question of taking into account these limitations. Uh, in what sense is information effectively de delocalized in gravity? Uh, there's still some things to uh, understand better here. And in short, are these effects sufficient to communicate information outside a black hole, which is basically what uh, seems to be needed and resolve the problem of black hole information? Or is some new non-perturbative structure uh, needed uh, to uh, go beyond say the perturbative gravity story? Uh, again, we need to non-perturbatively solve the constraints. And if you think about it, that in some sense, in the context of black holes means we have to solve the problem in order to solve the problem. So in any case, let's go back to our assumptions. And now I've added quantum mechanics on the list. So this is the set of assumptions that are in contradiction. And so we can arrange this set of assumptions in various ways. If quantum mechanical evolution uh, is true and black holes disappear, then one or two or both must fail. And we can think of that as sort of a non-locality theorem. There's some correction to locality uh, as seen in local quantum field theory that we can think of as version two of the theorem. Uh, but let's suppose that there is at least to a good enough approximation a notion of subsystems in gravity. Uh, and so, you know, effectively something like this product structure holds uh, for all practical purposes or this structure of the state. Uh, 
And if that's true, then uh, quantum mechanics plus subsystems plus disappearance at the end of evolution implies that distinct black hole states don't have uh, identical exterior evolution. So we can call that version three of the theorem. And that's important because that says that there must be new black hole state dependent interactions. There must be something that tells the exterior about the state in the interior of the black hole. And that's a story I've been developing uh, over a series of references over uh, the past, uh, well, number of years. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting one to consider uh, and one that we may well be led to uh, by this whole uh, story. So I'll uh, take the last amount of time to just quickly go through uh, some highlights of that. So <clears throat> such black hole state dependent interactions clearly would violate uh, semi-classical locality, locality about the semi-classical geometry, but we don't know the full quantum story, so that might not be so bad. Uh, what we can do is try to explore these in a principled parameterization of ignorance. And, you know, these kinds of things can be very powerful. In fact, let me just remind you that you can sort of derive local quantum field theory with a parameterized um, or principled parameterization of ignorance. That's one perspective on how we get to local quantum field theory. So there's a brief overview of this story uh, here in uh, this paper. Uh, but so we assume that the state, including the black hole in its environment, takes the form we've described. And of course, uh, we have the Hamiltonian that describes the local quantum field theory evolution, but there must be some correction to that. And let's imagine that is in, a, in an appropriate sense, uh, small. Uh, and what that correction needs to do is it needs to uh, lead to some dependence of the exterior state on the uh, interior state of the black hole. It needs to transfer information. The simplest form of a correction to the Hamiltonian that can do that is a product of an operator that acts on the interior part of the black hole times a product or times an operator that acts on the uh, environment. So here, let's just take a basis of all of the operators uh, that act on the interior states. So I'm thinking of I and J as labeling the, you know, all possible black hole internal states. Uh, so we have something of this form and uh, the exterior part of the operator, uh, if the exterior part of the state is at least to a good approximation described by local quantum field theory, uh, we might expect to build to a good approximation from local quantum field theory operators. Uh, but is there any other guidance about what those look like? Well, first we expect that they need to act well, they need to act on a scale out to beyond the horizon radius, or they need to, these operators uh, that you connect to need to be outside the black hole. Uh, and you expect that they act on a scale of, of order the event horizon radius. Um, compare also now the wormhole discussion we talked about earlier. Uh, one reason for this is that's sort of the natural scale here. You could say, well, let's let them act just a Planck length outside the horizon and that's it. Uh, but that's not very natural and that leads to a firewall. So uh, this is this sort of naturalness is a way of avoiding firewalls. Uh, and moreover, you know, that's really in a strong sense, as I think one can explain, uh, where the black hole radiation is truly uh, produced is in sort of a quantum atmosphere region with a size of order of the black hole uh, horizon rate or the uh, black hole radius outside the horizon radius. Um, so that's one uh, thing that one can, I think, pretty strongly motivate. Uh, another reasonable hypos hypothesis is that these couplings are universal to all different uh, matter and fields. Uh, one reason is that that is a way to maintain uh, something that's close to the basic beautiful story of black hole thermodynamics, also, there are Gedanken experiments involving black hole mining, where basically say you thread a cosmic string through a black hole and you increase the rate at which it emits uh, radiation. And so you want a commensurate increase in the rate at which it emits information. Um, and so that is something that suggests universality. Uh, and then there's just the general property of gravity that it 
you know, it is sort of a universal, uh, it couples universally to, to everything. And so we can satisfy these conditions by writing our correction to the Hamiltonian in this form. So we've got the operators acting on the black hole state, and then let's couple to the stress tensor to make it universal with some functions here, which we can think of as roughly form factors, which are supported on scales of order of the black hole size, but of course extend, you know, of order that distance outside the horizon. Now we can take this expression and reorganize it by uh, combining the uh, operators acting on the black hole state and the form factors in this way uh, into this form where uh, we recognize it as something that's behaving as a perturbation to the metric because it's coupling to the stress tensor, but it's a perturbation to the metric that depends on the black hole state. So it's a black hole state dependent uh, metric perturbation. Okay, so what else can we say about a, Hamil a correction to the Hamiltonian which we've parameterized in this form? What other constraints? One very important thing is this Hamiltonian has a job to do. Uh, it must transfer information or entanglement and it needs to do it at a certain rate, basically to undo the damage done by Hawking uh, or Hawking radiation uh, at a rate of one qubit per uh, light crossing time of the black hole. So what is needed to do that? Well, first, what's sufficient is if this metric perturbation, uh, which again has variation on scales of order r uh, in a typical black hole state is of order one, that's clearly going to be sufficient. That's going to be able to convey information at the rate of one qubit per uh, light crossing time. Uh, that I'll refer to as the stronger coherent scenario. And that, that's really interesting if it's true, because if we have order one metric perturbations, which depend on the black hole state, uh, well, that could lead to effects on, uh, say, electromagnetic radiation that passes near the horizon, like we see with Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, at least, you know, the radiation there is, has an important component from down near the light ring, which is pretty close to the horizon. And so you might get, for example, some time-dependent distortion of the images. And this is a story which we've explored at some level. And in fact, the very nice image from M87 now, uh, I think if you're careful about it, leads to some bounds on this kind of scenario. Uh, although I don't think this kind of scenario is by any means ruled out uh, at this point. So, but one is actually able to bound it. Uh, so that would be very interesting, but there's a question, what size is truly necessary for these couplings in order to uh, transfer the information out? And this gets to a general problem uh, for you know, quantum systems in general. If you have two quantum systems and you, they have some coupling, what's the information and transport rate between those subsystems you know, with some assumptions about how the individual systems say thermalize? And so that's something we've investigated in these references here. And there's a conjecture uh, for at least in an approximation what the information transfer rate is. And a very simple version of that is it's essentially given by Fermi's golden rule, because if you have two systems that are coupled and uh, say one emits a quantum in, that becomes an excitation in another, you can think of that as something like transfer of one bit of information. So the rate of transfer of information, uh, let's compare it to the rate for a transition is uh, by Fermi's golden rule, two pi times the density of final states times the matrix element squared of the Hamiltonian or the perturbation to the Hamiltonian. Uh, the density of final states includes uh, this large number of black hole internal states given by an exponential of a black hole entropy, which perhaps is roughly of order the size of the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And if that's huge, then we can get the kind of rate that we want uh, with a very small uh, correction to the Hamiltonian, something that's exponentially small in that entropy. Uh, and so, for example, in a typical black hole state, the expectation value of the metric perturbation uh, would be, say, this exponentially small value. So I'll refer to that as the weak or incoherent scenario. And that's going to be harder to see with Event Horizon Telescope, since it's not a big coherent perturbation of the metric, but uh, potentially could be accessible via gravitational wave scattering. Because if you look at the amplitude to scatter a gravitational wave off this object, taking into account the correction to the Hamiltonian, uh, there's a similar formula, uh, Fermi's golden rule, where you just put in now states corresponding to the initial and final graviton states. And uh, 
you have again here your coupling and you have the same kind of scalings where you can get an order one amplitude from the uh, large contribution of the black hole final state factor uh, and then the small uh, effective metric perturbation. So you can get say an order one uh, correction to gravitational wave scattering at wavelengths say of order R. Again, that's related to the fact that the typical scales in the metric perturbation are at scales of order R. So that would lead to a modification to absorption or reflection of gravitational waves from uh, black holes when you take into account quantum effects and suggests the possibility of consequences for gravitational wave observation, say be a LIGO, Virgo, et cetera, uh, because you know, some component of the signal that they see involves these wavelengths. So that's something still uh, being explored and which we'd like to explore more completely. So just to uh, summarize uh, the talk, uh, I've written down a set of um, assumptions or postulates here. Quantum mechanics, a black hole is a subsystem, distinct black hole states have identical exterior evolution, and black holes disappear at the end of that evolution. Uh, and as I've outlined, those are inconsistent, and that's the basic problem. Uh, if you have a proposal for how to resolve it, it's helpful to understand how it evades this, and of course, what bigger structure that proposal is part of. Uh, this question of what are, how we should think about subsystems in gravity is an important one. Uh, it seems like a basic structural issue in quantum gravity. We have some results on that, but also there are some remaining puzzles. And then finally, I've uh, organized this set of postulates into uh, one version, version three of the black hole theorem. Uh, if quantum mechanics uh, holds, you do have an appropriate notion of subsystems to a good, good enough approximation and black holes disappear, then there must be new interactions coupling the internal states of a black hole to the environment of the black hole. Uh, those would appear non-local with respect to the semi-classical description. Uh, we can parameterize those and they lead to possible observational consequences. Uh, for example, uh, the event horizon telescope observations or gravitational wave observations. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Stephen, for this interesting talk. Let's see if we have questions. Do we have questions? Hello, uh, Steve, it's uh, Daniele. Um, Who again? Daniele. Okay. So I was. Uh, I was wondering, you emphasized a lot the non-local aspects uh, as uh, something that uh, is almost inevitable in the full theory. Um, but the other aspect that uh, is tied to the semi-classical description, which uh, is likely not going to survive the full quantum theory, is uh, the existence of a well-defined temporal direction. Uh, so should I, sh should I mention the one you're using for defining evolution to be actually at some uh, asymptotic infinity, or uh, is it supposed to go on uh, to label the evolution also of the bulk states of the interior states? Because in the second case, I don't see how it could survive uh, the, 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 in the quantum phase in which the black hole disappears. So that was a little hard to hear because of sound quality issues, but I think you're asking about you know, how to think about time in quantum gravity, roughly speaking, uh, and the evolution of the state. So uh, certainly we have something like, we expect to have something like a time asymptotically, or one can even think of this in terms of an S matrix uh, like description where we have in states and out states, that's an even cruder version. Um, but, you know, if we have, uh, quantum mechanics, then we will say, let's think about it just in an S matrix language. We, we will have transitions between uh, initial states and final states, say, that we can describe in terms of amplitudes. Uh, so, so at that crude level, we have the notion of you know, beginning and end. And then the question is, uh, you know, how close do we have to something that is really behaving like time evolution in the bulk? And so the leading order, uh, in quantum gravity, we have the usual local quantum field theory story where you do have that, but yes, that could be part of the story that we really want to uh, 
or we really have something that, that doesn't quite exactly look like that in, in quantum gravity. Uh, again, you know, you, you can think of there being an evolution operator because for example, you can step forward on the boundary, uh, but uh, in the end, uh, what that evolution operator is acting on, what the nature of the states is and whether there is a true notion of sort of time in the bulk uh, is another question. Have another short question. Hello, Unison. You, can you hear me? Say again. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, not too well. Uh, it, if you can try to find a way to uh, get the microphone to clearly pick up the. I would like to ask about status of the following ideas or calculations, which. We did on some other people also about, about the information which is stored at infinity in the form of gravitational memory effect. So somehow when the black hole disappears, this information becomes available at infinity in the form of gravitational uh, memory effects. That's what is the status of that ideas or calculations? Thank you. Good. Yeah. So I, I briefly touched on that just to say a few more words. Uh, so it, it's sort of the leading order effect, it looks like you can uh, sort of eliminate the, uh, the evidence for the details of the state in the asymptotic gravitational field because uh, you don't have to have that asymptotic gravitational field correlated with all the detail, detailed features of the state. It's only sensitive to the, say, total point ray charges. Uh, and so I touched on that. Uh, so in, that's the sense in which, say, uh, soft hair may not capture all of the information. Now, there's a, a sort of uh, next story where, you know, if you had the full gravitational dressing and you look at this in the full quantum theory, there's this story about sort of taking the state and translating it out to infinity and measuring it. So in some sense, that's suggesting you do have access to properties of the state out at infinity. Uh, again, that seems to require going beyond perturbative order to really make that work. Although, you know, they're sort of exponentially small effects of perturbative order. So, so there is still an interesting question about in what sense the information truly is available at infinity, uh, whether that practically is true. All right, thank you again, Stephen. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. So is did you finish with this? Uh, okay. So uh, we are at the end of uh, another uh, excellent uh, workshop uh, here, and uh, maybe we should uh, thank uh, several things. Uh, one is uh, the Humboldt uh, Foundation for the partial support of uh, uh, the event. Uh, the next, uh, of course, is to thank all the speakers uh, who made uh, these uh, uh, workshops uh, so successful. Uh, what we tried in this uh, uh, workshop, uh, as I told you in the beginning, was a little bit different from what we tried in the previous ones and what we will try from tomorrow. So in the previous workshops, uh, in the, uh, say, on the workshop on standard model and beyond, we tried to bring experts together. Actually, it was also a dialogue with uh, experimentalists. Uh, then we had uh, three uh, string workshops in different uh, uh, directions. Uh, who tried to bring together the experts. And this is the idea also 
uh, of the workshop uh, tomorrow, which will bring together experts uh, on non commutativity uh, What we tried in this workshop, at least the idea was to bring representative uh, uh, scientists of uh, the various uh, directions of uh, beyond the standard model, cosmology, various uh, uh, string directions and non commutativity to bring them together and to make uh, a dialogue, a scientific dialogue. Uh, and uh, we have a huge scientific committee, as you see here, uh, who actively made suggestions for the speakers, actually. Looks huge now that I see it, but it was. Uh, uh, it was done in a successful way. They came with uh, uh, advisors for speakers, and we had, uh, as you know, also a young uh, uh, scientist uh, who uh, spoke, participated in this uh, uh, dialogue. So, from this point of view, uh, I think. What the In this, from this point of view, I think it was uh, very successful. Uh, in the negative things, I would say that uh, due to pandemic, uh, I should add also the you know the positive things that we managed to bring, uh, as you saw, uh, several people from uh, from states, which are uh, normally uh, this is normally difficult to, uh, to 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 bring them uh, as a speakers. But uh, now, of course, we have this opportunity. Uh, in the negative. Uh, the negative is obvious that uh, due to pandemia we did not have the required um, uh, interaction and uh, Humboldt in a way promised that uh, if we have a successful meeting which I think we did uh, they promised for next year to have a real meeting with uh, real people here actually the it's a little bit funny because the idea of uh, uh, of Humboldt uh, was that uh, all speakers practically would be uh, uh, online and uh, only Greeks <laughs> would be here. <laughs> what I see, <laughs> the Greeks are a real uh, minority, but still they are. So we did better than uh, expected. Uh, the organizing committee, which uh, eventually decided about uh, uh, the speakers and it was uh, also there a dialogue is this one and i would like also to uh, thank the those who were chairing uh, the sessions and uh, last but not uh, least i would like uh, the brave uh, guys uh, who stayed there for the whole period and they managed uh, all this uh, in the national uh, discussion. And of course, uh, uh, last, last but not least, uh, we have to thank uh, Iphigenia. <laughs> so, thank all of them. And uh, well, for those who are leaving, of course, um, uh, I would say. Uh, a good uh, safe uh, trip back and uh, for those who stay i'm sure we will enjoy more uh, from tomorrow we start a new workshop uh, from this year we we established that uh, in the welcome reception we have uh, also a cultural event so we we'll have two calls tomorrow to uh, join us so that's from me, if somebody wants to add something. Uh, Actually, if you can hear me as the last speaker, I had something to add. So, uh, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, of course, I, I should have added this before the questions, but I, I want to uh, thank uh, you know George especially and uh, the rest of the uh, organizing committee and scientific committee for a diverse and stimulating meeting in these very challenging times. Uh, so, you know, thank you very much for putting this together. I think a lot of people there are glad to be back. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but thank you. So next year we'll be all here, right? In person. We hope. Okay. So thank you all.